This is Bazaar Morning Call. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning. You're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. Uh, we are coming to you live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios. And one just hopes that after last week's pain and... Uh, you know, a little bit of down and down kind of market that we had this week brings a little bit of stability. That's what uh, we can hope for, at least to begin the week. I'm Prashant, with me, my colleague Sonia Nigel. Guys, good morning. Hi, good morning, Prashant. Good morning, morning, Nigel. And such a dichotomous market, right? On one hand, the Dow saw its best week in so many years. And uh, for us, our own markets have been under yeah. so much pressure. So clearly, maybe decoupling is what the Indian markets are seeing. Well, I think it's temporary in, uh, in, uh, and only in the near term, right? Because we've got a big political event that's up ahead of us. And after a while, last week, the Nifty, in fact, underperformed all the Asian markets as well as the global market. So I think we have volatility for the next 10 sessions on and then we continue uptrend. Uh, I mean, election results are early week, early June. Yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, till that point, you perhaps uh, are... You know, it's a bit of a constraint, right? I mean, there's no real big, uh, anything very big which is perhaps going to happen till that point on. That's the broad kind of message uh, from out here. Well, let's just take a quick look at what you need to know as we begin another session. And we'll pick up from where we left off on Friday because on Friday, uh, we supported and sort of uh, defended an important trend line support. The chart that we put up all day on Friday uh, and uh, the low was 21,930. Uh, we didn't quite, we didn't break that, and uh, which means that that is still very much in play. So the Nifty, uh, it, it left off in a way that it was a da positive daily close as well, which is also a good thing. Uh, so I think it gives us something to look forward to. Now, global queues remain very supportive, but it's not that it's mattered too much. The S&P was up a little bit, the Nasdaq was down, the 10-year bond deal was uh, up five basis points. Uh, and you also had the dollar index, which is just above the 105 odd levels or so. So day on day, I may be... Uh, you know, a little worse off looking at yields and dollar, but not very much really. You also had the University of Michigan uh, sort of consumer sentiment data which came through. It was weaker than expected, but uh, the inflation component of the data was stronger than expected. So, you know, there uh, you had uh, uh, the, <clears throat> the and I think the inflation number which we will get later this week, which is on Wednesday, the CPI number perhaps is the big data release, which I think is going to be pretty important for the Fed meeting as well. So 0.3% month-on-month increase in core CPI is already baked in. Anything more, 0.35, 0.4, and then you perhaps get a bit of a negative surprise here. Otherwise, I mean, I think at 0.3, that's in the price. On Friday, another thing out of the blue, right? U.S., China, tariff kind of uh, headlines dominated a lot of the media. I mean, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, they all reported. Uh, and one thing kind of stood out. So essentially, the, the report suggested that the Biden administration of the U.S. is looking at imposing very high tariffs on green exports out of China. And uh, one of the sort of important things of uh, green exports is EVs. Uh, and uh, the Biden administration could be looking uh, at tariffs of uh, 100% on Chinese EVs. I mean, you know, the Chinese EV ecosystem, of course, is far ahead of pretty much everywhere around the world. And uh, this is something which we are picking up. Now, will this once again escalate into a trade war tit for tat kind of a reaction or will this be very targeted and we're still by the way six months away from an election but china tariffs remain the number one talking point between both the republicans and democrats here in india there is of course uh, the a big political event today is the fourth phase of lok sabha elections 96 seats go to vote uh, and uh, i think you know we're already by the way at 283 seats right 283 done and 96 today uh, so it's a big phase and we'll talk more about this one as well. A lot of the focus, of course, in the last three phases has been on turnout, etc. And so much interest around uh, how this is going. Now, uh, just to circle back in time, the levels here, you basically need a confirmation that the market perhaps is going to respect that trend line support at 21,930 or so. And how will you get that confirmation? By building on. And the index first needs to cross the 22,281 level. That's a 40-day exponential moving average. And then, of course, the 20-day comes in at 22,368. These are, again, all very near-term levels that we are looking at. And, of course, I mean, we should not break Friday's low, which is 21,932. That's also the trend line support. And that's an absolute minimum that the market should respect. Bank Nifty has trend line support, similar kind of level. It did not make a low in Jan, but in February, that number for the Nifty Bank is 47,225. Same levels we put out on Friday morning as well. And on the, Nifty, on, on the way up, Bank Nifty has resistance at 47,791. 
which is the 40 hourly, and then the 20 day moving average, which is at 48,265. I think easy does it. Slow and steady, watch the market. In any case, I mean, the index has been doing what it is doing, but so much and wild and big reactions to earnings, right, uh, which have been coming through as well, which we will discuss as we go along. The start is down another 40 points this morning, but I think we'll have to see uh, what that changes to by the time we open at 9.15. Sonia. Absolutely. You know, it's better to be cautious in this market, given that we have that big political event yeah. upon us. And also, the market has been showing some signs of weakness over the last many days. Uh, so let's just take it straight to the implied opening for now is suggesting a 40-point cut. So it's not going to be a good opening at all. There's been large foreign selling in the market, right? And that is something that I think has worried the street quite a bit. If you look at it, FI has once again sold about 2,000 crores in the cash markets on Friday. And put together in the month of May so far, FIs have sold almost 25,000 crores. So the old adage, sell in May and go away, is pretty much playing out in its entirety in the month of May so far. But the good part is on Friday, we held on to the 22 thousand mark. So let's see if that becomes a line in the sand for the market. Uh, the US markets have been very stable and we were talking about the dichotomy there. Most global markets are doing pretty well. You, the Dow in fact saw the best week of the year last week and was up about 125 points on Friday. So uh, we have been decoupling from the US markets. It's largely because of the election uh, jitters. But even if you look at what individual stocks are doing, right, uh, Tata Motors came out with its numbers on Friday. The management commentary was quite cautious. They guided for flat margins in FY25 for JLR. They spoke about most global markets seeing some pain. And that, I think, may not go down very well with the street, considering that the stock has rallied quite a bit as well. Uh, Tata Motors says they remain cautiously optimistic even on domestic demand and they expect H1, the first half, to be relatively weaker, which means that they're facing headwinds both in global as well as in local markets and that could result in some sort of pressure on the stock. Uh, on the flip side though, Aisha Motors, I'm expecting, uh, you know, uh, the stock to perhaps be stable because there were no surprises in the numbers. It was a strong operational performance. The margins went up 270 basis points year on year at 27.6%. Now, in terms of earnings today, you have stocks like JSPL, Zomato, UPL that will be uh, announcing their numbers and important ones there considering that stocks like Zomato have rallied a whole lot. But largely, you'd have to say that this is a market that has been trending lower. The Nifty Bank has also been under a bit of pressure for the last many weeks and months. So maybe you could see some more you know, trepidation over there. And as we head into the June 4th event, the counting day, the market volatility is something that can continue. Well, that's right, Sonia. And just take a look at the India VIX, the way that's been surging, tell you that there will be volatility you know, till we get those uh, results. But let's focus on today's trading session then. I think the Nifty's in that broad 500 point range uh, odd and we'll have to keep an eye out on that mark. The Nifty Bank, that holds the key. That's been on an eight session losing streak and that needs to see a bit of a bounce. For the bulls to have any kind of hope, the Nifty Bank didn't participate even in the pullback that we saw on Friday and that holds the key. At one point of time, remember, it was up close to around 300 points odd. What did the FIs do? Well, this time it was even Stevens. They added longs as well as shorts, you know, 20,000 contracts apiece and now the short positioning is added on 66%. In absolute terms, it's holding around 1.6 lakh contracts. But as I told you, even in Friday's trading session and Thursday, that on a like-to-like -like basis, it's still not at that 1 lakh contracts. Why is that? Because the lot size itself has changed. So effectively, this 1.6 lakhs contracts is, you know, if you compare it with the, with the earlier lot size, it'll be around 80,000 contracts. So we're still not at that 1 lakh contracts, but a net short market is something that I like. And that's something that will hold, uh, you know, the bulls in good stead if, in fact, we do see a bit of a bounce. Let's focus on the options data. And that 22,000 put, well, that's seeing a fair bit of writing. And that's going to give the bulls some bit of a hope because the premium has come down to around 120 odd. That's telling you that the bulls want to defend those lower levels. 21,800 odd, they believe that they can defend that. And that brings us to the levels, you know, because 21,800, that's closer to where the swing low is. So this is a crucial uh, mark on the downside. And the bulls don't want this to get breached. While on the upside, that 22,300, 22,350 mark, will be a bit of a resistance zone and we have the 20 and the 50 DMA as well out there. The Nifty Bank, you know, that's in a broad 1,000 point range out there and you don't want it to, uh, you know, break this 100 DMA on the downside. It's on an eight session losing streak. You wanted to get some kind of momentum, gradually move towards around the 20 DMA and that holds the key even in today's trading session. Focusing on stocks, I'm tracking two stocks. One is ABB India. 
you know, a few sessions ago, we had highlighted that there was long buildup out there. There was delivery-based buying as well. So and now we know, you know, that in fact, the street was sensing that maybe in fact, those numbers were much better than what the street had. We'll have to wait by for the analyst call as well. But the margins came in at record high. The gross margins are around 40%. That's the best in history. So ABB could be the stock of the day in terms of result reactions. And in terms of a cash market stock, well, Thyro came one of the biggest underperformers of the recent past. I think the stock is half of what we saw a couple of years ago in 2021 or so. But in, uh, you know, in Friday's trading session, massive delivery based buying, more than 5 lakh shares getting delivered. It's the highest we have seen since December 2022. So that's a stock I'll be looking at. And if you look at it technically, at around that 630-odd mark, well, you have the crucial zones, the 20 as well as the 50 DMA. So it's at a crucial support zone. It's seen delivery based buying. That's the cash market stock that I'm going to be looking at. Okay, thanks a lot for that. So lots of stocks in focus this morning. But on the equities front, first up, we have a comment coming in from Mahesh Nandurkar of Jefferies, who says that the March quarter earnings season so far has seen their analysts raising FY25 earnings for more than half of the 88 companies under coverage. Result season highlights include improved rural outlook, weak IT guidance, growth restraints by banks and strong property markets. Mahesh adds that heightened near-term risks drive tactical model portfolio changes, i.e. weight cut on industrials and mid-caps like KEI and NTPC in the PSU basket and added weight to staples like Marico and Godrich Consumer. Okay, well, let's get you some money market views here. On the rupee, we have Kunal Sadani of Shiran Bank who says that Fed officials reiterated the longer for higher mantra, supporting US dollar against its peers, US CPI, to take the center stage this week with expectations of 3.4% year-on-year rise. Dollar index continues to find support at 104.75 levels. For the USD INR, he says 83.42 to the dollar is going to act as a support, while 83.6 to the dollar will be the resistance. And on the bonds, Ajay Magnolia of JM Financial says that yields remain stable in the absence of any directional triggers. Announcement of another round of buyback for 60,000 crores to infuse liquidity may upkeep the sentiment. CPI inflation data is due today post markets, which is expected to come in at 4.8%. And this may fuel a rally in bond yields. Expect the old 10-year benchmark to trade in a range of 7.09 to 7.15%. And the new one in a range of 7.04 to 7.10% range for the day. Well, we're going to be focusing on a lot of stocks, uh, action-packed week over the weekend. But for the time being, let's run you through all the top 10 stocks that we're tracking for you. We're looking at Aicha Motors, ABB India, Kalyan Jewelers, Thermax, Viral Pharma. All of them will be reacting to positive news flow. Add to the list, BEML and Jupiter Life. Uh, all seven stocks will be reacting to positive news flow. On the flip side, Tata Motors, APL Apollo Tubes. And J.K. Cement will be reacting to a rather weak set of numbers. Okay, all right. Uh, well, that's the stock list to watch, and we'll get to more in this uh, in just a bit. Matt Orton is uh, with us for now, Chief Market Strategist at Raymond James Investment Management. Uh, Matt, uh, good morning. Great to have you with us here on CBC TV 18. Thank you very much for your time. You know, <clears throat> global uh, markets have been actually pretty supportive, whereas here in India, I mean, I guess uh, there are some election jitters. Uh, just kind of contextualize the global environment, though. Uh, and uh, specifically, if you want to comment on these uh, sort of uh, tariff headlines that we heard on Friday uh, that kind of dominated uh, the U.S. session. And we're six months out. Uh, so this will only get louder as we get closer to it. Yeah, good morning, Prashant. Great to see you again. And you're absolutely right. I think there, there's a lot of noise that's going on. You're seeing election noise in India right now. We're going to be going through the thick of election noise probably once we get to the summer, at least into the fall and then November when elections ultimately happen. But the global backdrop is very, very positive. I think what you've seen is you've seen economic growth in the U.S. remain pretty resilient. And most importantly, earnings have continued to come into the upside. It's been an incredibly positive earnings season in the U.S. And when you look globally outside of the U.S., you're seeing positive momentum in China. There's almost been a floor put in place because of government actions and willingness to step into the market. You're seeing economic upside with respect to Europe. Things just aren't as bad as suspected. And earnings there, again, haven't been as bad as feared. And over in Japan, you finally have inflation, which is positive. And you're also seeing strong earnings and, and a lot of corporate reforms coming to bear. So investors have reasons to be optimistic. What I've been telling clients, though, Rashawn, as I've been traveling, is a big part of your portfolios right now should be about rotation. 
Right now, it's really important to find ways to diversify your portfolios away from just technology, which was really the only thing that's worked over the past year. But there's a lot of cyclical parts of this market, both in the US and globally, that look very, very attractive. And I've been advising to use weakness as an opportunity to put some cash to work. Okay, use the weakness as an opportunity to put some cash to work. Uh, is that your view for the Indian markets as well? Because this has been a fairly steady market, but now we have a big election upon us. So for the rest of the year, what's your view here? Yes, Sonia, you know, I've, I've been a, a fan of India and investing in India for the past two plus years, which has paid off quite well. And I have actually been using weakness in India opportunistically because I think once we get past the results on June 4th, uh, I think investors are going to be much more optimistic. Again, earnings results and earnings are being upgraded going forward for the rest of the year. There's a very solid economic backdrop, and I think there's going to be a lot of optimism about the future of India, about a developing, burgeoning middle class spending money. So I think you're going to see a confluence of that come together once we get through some of the volatility event. So I think in India, just like the rest of the world, you have to be selective in what you own. There's a number of areas of the market that have mm. run pretty significantly. So you want to lean into quality. You want to lean into mm. where there's margin strength and when you're see where you're seeing a little bit of acceleration in earnings. All right. Hi, Matt. Good to see you in as always. Uh, so India appears to be that structural story and that's broadly the feedback that we get. Uh, but talking about the Indian markets, you know, and stocks that you like, I think from the auto space, you like Mahindra and Mahindra, tell us more about that. And from the aviation pack, I think uh, Interglobe, even at these valuations, uh, you know, it's the largest player, so you're quite bullish out there. Run us through a couple of the stocks you run, you like. Yeah, absolutely, Nigel. I think on the auto area, I mean, autos have been a big contributor to growth of the Indian market. They've been, they've been a bastion of strength. I think Mahindra Mahindra is, is a top pick of mine because you've seen margins hold up even as the order books has kind of been going through a little bit of a reworking phase earlier this year. But it has exposure not only to light motor vehicles, to light SUVs, but also to the farm side, which is, I think, going through a period of, of recovery. So I think when we come out the other side, you're going to see an earnings acceleration there. Um, and, and again, it's a different story from, say, Tata overall. And when you look to an interglobe, for example, uh, on the passenger airline side, Indians are traveling. You're seeing more and more Indians traveling, not only within India, but around the rest of the world. And interglobe has excellent exposure to a lot of that. You're seeing good margins and good spreads with respect to the cost of seats versus what customers are willing to pay. And I think a really positive sign has been their order of a number of wide body jets that are going to be able to get anywhere around the rest of the world compared to their current fleet where the longest route is probably seven or eight hours. So I think you're going to see continued growth of that company, which already has great exposure to a number of different markets and strengthening margins. Okay, we leave it at that. Thanks a lot, uh, Matt, for joining in. Have a great week ahead. And thank you for taking the time out. Let's thank, slip you. Into a thank you. Thank you. Let's slip into a quick break. On the other side, our entire research team will be with us and our list of top 10 stocks is lined up next. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. There are plenty of stocks to talk about, so let's get straight to it. First up is Tata Motors. I'm going with red on the stock because the co commentary was quite cautious on the call. Uh, the biggest negative, I think, from the commentary was that the JLR margin guidance for FY25 is flat year on year. So they don't expect any growth in the Jaguar Land Rover margins for FY25 because of certain headwinds that the market is seeing. They say that uh, there is a cost increase because of higher marketing spends that they've had to undertake and that will be offset by an improved JLR mix which is higher Range Rover and higher Range Rover Sports. However, they've maintained the FY26 guidance to be at 10% EBIT for JLR and they also maintain the FY25 guidance to be debt free. So in FY25, although the EBIT margins won't go up, the company will still become debt-free as, as per JLR is concerned. So uh, it is a bit of a cautious commentary, you'd have to say. The company didn't give any JLR volume guidance either. They said that demands will be very difficult in many different parts of the globe. 
in FY25. So hence, there's a bit of caution. Uh, Q1 is likely to be weak, would be free cash flow neutral. They are cautiously optimistic on the domestic CV demand as well, though they expect it to improve from the second half of FY25. Now, the India CV business guidance is also flat to a marginal decline. The cost headwinds are visible in Q1 and for FY25. Um, if you look at Q4 numbers, right, it's a mixed bag, so the revenues are largely in line, but the EBITDA and margins are slightly below what the street was estimating. Uh, so uh, the GLR margins as well, steady state uh, this time around, but slightly below expectations. Revenue growth of 10.7% for GLR, EBITDA up 22%, margins up 150 basis points year on year for GLR at 16.3%, but the uh, poll suggested 16.6%, so slightly below estimates and the profits up 23%. So for Tata Motors, I'm going with red. Let me also just quickly take you through Aisha Motors numbers. It was a strong operational performance, no two ways about that. The earnings were largely in line with estimates. There were no negative or positive surprises, but the numbers were good. Margins were up 270 basis points year on year. Margins came in at a multi-quarter high. Highest ever revenues that the company has posted in this quarter. A revenue growth of 9.5% is what Aisha has seen. And if you look at the margin trend, right, over the last five quarters, five quarters ago, Aisha Motors saw margins of around 24.5%. They've grown steady state because of raw materials coming off and operating leverage kicking in. In the conference call, the management said that they expect the two-wheeler market to grow and the middleweight segment uh, growth to be in double digits. They also spoke about how the Royal Enfield growth will be driven by new model launches. They are not seeing any headwinds in commodity prices, which means that the margins will continue to be uh, range-bound around these levels. So I'm going with green there. All right, yeah, the Tata Motors stock could get clunked, Sonia, because the market yes. has been net long on that one as well. So let's see how uh, that goes. But the stock of the day in terms of results could be ABB India. Vamakshi joins us to tell us more about that. Well, Vamakshi, it's a very expensive stock on valuations, but these numbers look good. Well, absolutely. It's a very uh, strong set of numbers that the company has posted this time around. It's a beat across the board. When we look at the revenues, they've come in nearly 7% higher than what we were expecting. In fact, revenue growth is largely being driven by the electrification as well as the process automation segment. And this, in fact, more than offset the temporary sluggishness that was seen in motion as well as robo uh, robotics and discrete automation. Apart from that, when we look at the margins, we were expecting somewhere around 14% uh, EBITDA margins, but they've actually come in at almost 18.2%. 3%, so a huge beat as far as the margins are concerned as well. And the net profit too has come in nearly 38% higher as compared to our expectations. Overall, on a year-on-year -year basis, net profit is uh, uh, up almost 88%, coming in at almost 460 crores. Now, the order inflows for the company also look quite healthy. Uh, order inflows stood at 3,607 crores, up nearly 14.6% sequentially and 15.4% year-on-year. In fact, with this, the company has maintained order inflow rate of around 3,000 crores for the last five to six quarters. The order backlog is also up quite healthily, up almost 25%. And this in turn provides very good revenue visibility for the company. But like you rightly pointed out, Nigel, uh, the stock is up year to date almost 54%. Uh, the valuations are also nearly uh, above uh, the five-year average. And overall, uh, can these uh, can this performance actually sustain? We will be waiting by for the commentary that comes through from the management in the concall that will, is scheduled today at almost 10 a.m. So overall, a good set of numbers. Expect the stock to open higher today. <clears throat> All right, well, Makshi, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, let's move on to Kalyan Jewelers, which reported numbers as well. Mangalam has got that one. Mangalam, morning. Good morning. So, good numbers coming in from Kalyan Jewelers. I mean, the street had a peek into the revenue growth of 34%, which they had uh, revealed in their, uh, you know, quarterly update as well. But uh, it's uh, fascinating the way the company has been uh, uh, performing, even internals. Uh, there have been some compromises on margins, but that's largely because the company is expanding via franchise route. And franchise route, remember, is ROCE accretive for the company. So, revenue growth of 34%. The EBITDA grew about 19%. Net profit on a low base grew 97% because on the exceptional uh, item, you know, in the base quarter, there was an exceptional loss of about 33-odd crores. India business grew 38% with the same store sales growth of 17%. That's a positive. Non-South business grew uh, or is around 49% of their sales versus 44% same time last year. Studded business is about 29% of their sales versus 28%. In fact, not only have they grown well, they've targeted for good growth for next year as well. They've, uh, uh, you know, looked at mid to high single digit same store sales growth for FI25, will further accelerate return on capital employed, will also increase revenue share coming in from non-South markets and are looking to divest some of their non-core assets to further strengthen their balance sheet. The stock has risen a lot, but with this growth runway, one sees some more green on Kalyan Jewelers.
Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, Vamakshi is back with us to tell us about Thermax and how it looked this time. Vamakshi, over to you. Well, a good set of numbers this time from Thermax. When we look at the revenue, it has come in nearly 3% higher than what we were expecting at 2,764 odd crores. Uh, the revenue growth is largely being driven by the industrial products as well as the infra segment. Good growth is also being witnessed in the green solution segment, which witnessed an uptick of almost 72%. However, the chemical segments degrew by almost 8% in the fourth quarter. When we look at the margins, the margins have also come in nearly 123 basis points higher year on year. Margin stand at 9.9%, so very close to the double digit mark and in fact this improvement is largely being driven by 104 basis points improvement in the industrial product EBIT margin as well as a 731 basis point rise in the green solutions business. Apart from that when we look at the EBITDA that has come in nearly 18% higher than what we were expecting and the net profit has also come in nearly 6% higher. Overall the order book also looks quite healthy. Uh, the order inflow was quite weak in the first half of FY24 and this in turn has picked up in the second half. Order booking in Q4 was nearly 2 higher at uh, 2,309 crores. The company says that they continue to build on stable orders. Inquiry inflow from steel, chemical and f &B continues to remain quite strong. But overall, a good set, uh, better than expectations. Expect the stock to open higher today. Got it. Vamakshi, thanks a lot for that. And uh, do note, we'll connect with the management of Thermax at 9.30 a.m. later today. Well, let's tell you about APL uh, Apollo Tubes then. The stock has come off a little bit from the recent high that we saw, and these numbers are disappointing. So on the top line, there was a growth of 8%. That was backed by volumes. Volumes were up by 4% on a year-on-year -year basis. On a sequential basis, it was up by close to 12%. So it appears they went for volumes, but that came at the cost of margins. And the management has said this, that demand was a little bit tepid ahead of the general elections. There was an ongoing slowdown in retail spending as well. So they you know, gave higher discounts, which in turn impacted the EBITDA per ton. And the EBITDA per ton came in at around 4,132, which is the lowest we've seen since quarter two FY23. So they've taken a knockback out there. And one of the reasons is the other expenditure, big spike up there on a sequential basis as well, up close to around 14%. So they got hit over there. The PAT number didn't contract as much because the tax rate was relatively lower in comparison to what we saw last year. The stock pulls back uh, a little bit to start off with. Remember, trades at very elevated valuations as well. So we'll see some red to kickstart trade. And let's see where it goes from there. But another good result was Pyramid Pharma. Ekta joins us to fill us in with more on that. Ekta, finally good results coming out from there. Well, yes, I expect the stock to be in the green today. Revenue up around 18-odd percent for Pyramid Pharma. The EBITDA was up 51% year-on-year and the margins came in at a multi-quarter high of 20.8% versus 16.2% and a profit of around 101 crores. Now, Q1, Q also margins 20.8% versus 13.7% and profit of 101 crores versus 10.1 crores on a Q1, Q basis. So, there's a significant improvement in the operational performance of Pyramid this time. Now, CDMO, Q4 revenue, which is, uh, the you know, the bulk of their business, was up 29% on a year-on-year -year basis. Complex hospital generics, which is basically anesthesia drugs mainly in the US, was down 5% year-on-year. India Consumer Healthcare, which is basically a lot of these OTC brands that they have, such as lactocalamine, etc., was up 14% on a year-on-year -year basis. The company says they saw a significant increase in order inflows amidst a difficult biotech funding environment, something which had impacted Syngene also. And the net debt came in at 2.9 times versus 5.6 times at the start of FY24. So there was an improvement in metrics all across. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Uh, Ekta, well, JK Cement, they came out with a set of numbers. It appears the numbers were a little bit disappointing. That's because of relatively higher costs than what the street was working with and volumes a little bit lower than what they were working with. Also, in terms of their mix, the white cement division contributed less, which in turn weighed on the margins. On a year-on-year -year basis, mind you, it looks good. The top line was driven basically by grey cement volumes, which were up by closure around 13%. The problem is on the margins. On a sequential basis, there's a sharp dip. On a year-on-year -year basis, it looks very, very good because it's coming on a low base. But realizations itself were down uh, on a you know on a quarter and quarter basis by around four and a half percent, and they got some benefit because power and fuel costs came in uh, sharply lower, and their focus on green power has gone up. So in the past year as well, green power as a percentage of the mix has gone up to around fifty one percent. That compares with around forty four percent, and they're looking at seventy five percent in the coming year. So that's what helped them. The problem is the other cost, freight and handling, other expenditure, employee cost. All of them went up more than anticipated, which hurt them. The PAT number though that came in higher on a year on year basis. The positive though, the numbers on the whole are a little lower than what the street was working with. But in spite of having a big CAPEX plan that's underway, they've reduced their debt by close to around 300 crores on a sequential basis and year-on-year -year basis. So it starts off in the red and then we see where it goes from there. 
But going back to Upasana, Upasana, BEML, how about those numbers? Well, Nigel, a good set of numbers reported by the company in its Q4 FY24. The revenue was seen at 1,513 crore with an uptick of almost 9% on one-way basis. EBITDA margins have also expanded sharply by almost 380 basis points at 24.5%. And coming to part of the company, it's up almost about 64% on a YNY basis at 257 crores. Now, in terms of order book position of the company, it stands at 11,872 crores, out of which 3,301 crore orders are executable in the current year. So, all in all, we are seeing a good set of numbers from BEML, hence I expect the stock to open in green today. All right. Uh, <clears throat> thanks uh, very much, Upasana, for that. Now, let's focus on Jupiter Life uh, with Ekta. Ekta, back to you. Well, yes, for Jupiter Life, I expect the stock to be in the green. It is a hospital company. Revenue, 290 crores versus 242 crores. Margins maintained at 21%. Profits are a good surge because they did see interest cost savings because they've repaid all of their debt as well. FI24 occupancy stood at 63.8% versus 62.5% year on year. And the average revenue per occupied bed has also improved on a year on year basis. Uh, the company has also acquired land in Pune for setting up 500 beds. It will be the fifth hospital by the company. Remember, the company has a goal of 2,500 beds in West India. The visibility has reached 2,200 beds with the latest Pune acquisition and the Dombivili hospital, which is coming up. So overall, things seem to be going well for the company. Expect the stock to be in the green. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, I also wanted to mention, you know, we were talking about Tata Motors, right? If you just pull up the stock, um, there are two downgrades which are coming on Tata Motors. We'll talk about that in greater detail later. But just wanted to quickly mention the reason why we're talking about it being in the red is Nomura and Morgan Stanley have both downgraded the stock to neutral, saying that, uh, you know, despite decent set of numbers, it's just that the stock has priced in a lot of the good news. So maybe you could see some... Uh, pressure over there. But here's a quick recap of our top stocks this morning. Stocks with positive news flow, there's Aisha Motors, ABB India, Kalyan Jewelers, Thermax, Piramal Pharma, BEML and Jupiter Lifeline Hospitals. While stocks with negative news flow, there's Tata Motors, APL Apollo Tubes as well as JK Cement. We'll take a short break. Up next, we'll connect with Polycab's Chairman and Managing Director Inder T.J. Singhani and the Executive Director and CFO Gandharv Tongia to talk about their Q4 earnings. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. Well, as promised, we have the management of Polycap joining us now. The company reported a good set of Q4 earnings. Revenues and profits both beat street estimates. Margins, but both the you know management uh, personnel are joining us now. We have Gandharv Tongia, who's the executive director and CFO, and Inder T. J. Singh. percent revenue growth in Q4 on account of a very good volume growth led by the cables and the wires business. Can you tell us what kind of volume growth do you see in cables and wires from here on? has been nothing short, uh, but short, uh, but marked by milestones, growth, and commitment to excellence. Um, we, as you are, as you are related, the value growth was almost 29 percent, and most of it, almost all of it, has come from volume. Uh, the fourth quarter was best ever in the as far as the top line is concerned. We did almost 5,600 crore rupees of top line. And the entire fiscal was again best in the history of the company, wherein we did almost 18,000 crore rupees. Volume led growth, we have been able to enhance our to 24% to 25-26%. And uh, we believe uh, that this growth momentum in areas. So Uh, fantastic capacities which we have built over the period with the help of our uh, partners who are there across the country. Got that. Uh, Gandhar, but I wanted some more clarity. Were sales impacted during the start of the department had conducted a surge 
uh, in, uh, of 23, and uh, this was a standard income duly provided to them. After that, um, as a post search procedure, we have re received some requests that have been duly complied with. And as of date, we haven't received any from the department. We will intimate these stock exchanges. Uh, in there for uh, cables and uh, wires, you had earlier a margin uh, range of between 11 and 13 percent. You've done 15 percent of the. F How sustainable is this uh, going forward? What's the outlook? Basically, margin will be around about 7, 12 to 13 percent EBITDA, and growth is going to be continued because demand is good. The infrastructure government is spending a lot of money and for electrification to villages and have Wi-Fi to every uh, village. So that infra is going to continue because they want to make this national highways and they want to make uh, all number of AIMS hospitals. So everywhere demand is good because the construction line is growing, industry is growing, industry is expanding in cement and steel plants. They are expanding everything. So everywhere demand is good and it is going to be continue is at least for five, seven years. So what is the revenue and the margin guidance for FY25? So as you are aware, we got listed in 2019 and after that, uh, we embarked on a transformation project with the help of a strategic consultant. The project name is uh, Project Leap. In fiscal 21, we decided that we should get to 20,000 crore rupees of top line by fiscal 26. I'm happy to report that in fiscal 24 itself, we have achieved a top line of 18,000 crore rupees. During the current fiscal, in the fiscal 25, we'll probably recalibrate our guidance and come back to you. However, as far as margins are concerned, as Indarbhai uh, alluded to, we should be able to maintain a better margin of 12 to 13 percent uh, for our business. Yeah, Gandharva, you know, I had a couple of questions on this FMCG, FMEG segment itself. The margins are under pressure due to a one-time impact from the impairment of investment. Was there any other factor? And also, how are you assessing consumer demand in this segment? More importantly, by when do you turn profitable? Do you stand by earlier margin guidance of around 10 to 12 percent by FY26? You know, as I mentioned a while back, under Project Leap, we had uh, various ambitions. One was to get to a better cable and wire business in terms of top line, bottom line profitability. And I'm happy to report that uh, uh, on cable and wire, we have been able to enhance our market share. The top line growth is significantly better than the industry growth rate. The margins are significantly better than what they used to be five years back. Uh, and similarly, exports contribution has announced over the period. Five years back, exports used to be 250 crore rupees per annum, whereas in the last year, it was almost 1,400 crore rupees per annum. Uh, so these were the areas where we were able to perform better. And in few of the pockets, probably we did better than our own expectations. Uh, however, uh, in the case of FMEG, I think it's a big spec. Uh, the retail wire business has done very good, but uh, the businesses like uh, fans, lighting, such as switch gear, we believe we could have done better. Since last uh, six months, uh, we have revisited our strategy. We have rebuilt the team and uh, merged uh, Power BU with FMEG BU. Uh, we are uh, doing what is typically called force correction. And we believe in four quarters from now, we should be able to go back to a better growth trajectory. Uh, in the interim, uh, we believe that there's a need to revisit our FMEG guidance. And in the last quarter itself, we had withdrawn our guidance of 10% of FMEG profitability. Uh, and probably three or four quarters from now, we will come back and then uh, share our revised guidance uh, for FMEG, both for growth as well as for profitability. Mm. Uh, Indraji, uh, you planned for between 600 and 700 crores of CAPEX for F524. Could you tell us how much of that uh, was spent? What is the CAPEX? Uh, the, uh, how much will you spend on CAPEX this year in F525? And uh, what is the revenue potential from this? Uh, you know, do you uh, also, if you have plans for further expanding electricals, go on, sir. Yeah, we are continuously expanding our product range because of range. We are putting a more capex and cable and wire. Also, we are putting continuously. We are going in extra high voltage cables, and my, so we are putting going to put at least seven eight hundred to thousand crores every year now. So we have made a plan of three years coming three years. 
and it will be continue in FMA and give environment. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gandharv, your gross margins have improved on account of, uh, you know, the strategic pricing revisions as well as a change in the product mix. Can you give us an overview of the product mix from here on? Any changes that you expect which can perhaps improve your margins further? So, uh, we get almost 88% from our cable and wire business and between EPC and FMAG, we have a balance 12%. Uh, we don't expect this particular ratio to materially undergo change on a near-term to mid-term basis. But overall, directionally, we believe that we, we have a lot of uh, opportunity in the B2C space. And as part of Project Leap, we will continue to make efforts to get to uh, leadership position in the B2C space. Uh, as far as profitability is concerned, we believe that a 12 to 13 percent EBITDA margin is a sustainable margin, and uh, we believe in quarters to come we should be able to maintain that. Thanks, gentlemen, for joining in. Wishing you all all the best for the remainder of this fiscal. Well, uh, let's get chatting with our market expert now. Prakash Sivan joins us on the show. Hi, Prakash. Good morning. Hope you had a good weekend. Well, let's start off by talking about Polycab itself. You know, I'm looking at their numbers, very, very good. Highest ever quarterly profit is what they delivered. In the cables and wires business, they've gone ahead and got a higher chunk in terms of market share. I think it's increased by around 200 uh, basis points odd. The stock is not very, very cheap. But with these sort of numbers, does it demand these elevated valuations of around 35 times odd? Good morning, Nigel. Thank you. Uh, I think, you know, this, this kind of a performance was largely anticipated given what had happened uh, in, in the Jan, Feb, March quarter from, you know, some of the uh, regulatory action that uh, took place. Uh, you know, the revenue recognition norms would have changed. Uh, things would have been slightly more uh, positively disposed towards, uh, uh, you know, the PNL getting strengthened. But, you know, whether these uh, margins are sustainable, uh, that that is a big question, and uh, to answer that, I can tell you the capex that they are looking at uh, undertaking will will actually move them into the leadership. I mean, make their position in the leadership market segment very strong. So you know that's that's where they probably have a right to win. But uh, I I don't see any reason why the valuation would probably soften so much because it's it's leading the you know wires and cables back so dominantly. That uh, if you if you see on the ground in terms of the distribution network and all, it's it's fairly uh, well acclaimed, uh, well accepted, and I think the product range needs to kind of you know the FMEG is suffering because I I haven't seen any innovative launches, any disruptive thought process behind that. But probably you know as uh, the CFO was indicating, they probably are re-looking at uh, uh, some parts on the distribution side. So if that happens, you'll probably have another engine uh, on which it starts revving up. But I, I would expect the the uh, higher valuations to sustain. I know it's a question. Uh, you would end up buying it on dips to make sense because uh, you will get these dips in the volatility that we are uh, seeing. And, and then it probably makes sense your risk reward starts getting better. But the trajectory seems to be very strong going forward. Prakash, hi. Good morning. I think you know what my next question is going to be on Tata Motors. Because, you know, the numbers were not bad, but the commentary was a bit cautious, right? They expect EBIT margins to be flat in FI25 for Jaguar Land Rover. So, no growth there. Uh, but uh, how do you see the stock move today? Uh, good morning, Sonia. So, you know, very interesting set of numbers. Uh, because, you know, suddenly it's only when you come to the guidance that you realize that there's something which you need to be cautious about. But otherwise, it uh, made you believe that uh, they, they are firing on all cylinders, JLR, domestic PVs. And of course, you know, the CV cycle, which probably is uh, some time away. But uh, if, if you look at Ashok Leyland's uh, performance, there's no reason why their uh, CV uh, business will not pick up as well. You know, interestingly, what, what the management seems to be doing, and this is my view uh, from anecdotally tracking the con calls and, uh, you know, reactions thereof. They're trying to manage expectations and build in some sort of a caution that uh, things could not be as robust as what's happened last year. I mean, it's been a stellar FI20 but uh, whether FI25 can replicate that is a big question. The answer is not necessarily, and that's that's exactly why they're trying to manage that. But I would buy it on dips uh, because there's no reason why suddenly things will start getting uh, very different, uh, Sonia. You know, in fact, the raw material price uh, pressure that he spoke about, uh, I, I don't think that's such an uh, you know immediate thing that you need to worry about. So, you know, the likes of Aisha and all are actually gaining out because of the softness in RM prices. There's no reason why this. And the big triggers will be deleveraging to continue. 
and to come to some conclusion which i was expecting would be announced but hasn't had timelines come through but you will see the the segregation of the cv and the pv business becoming a big trigger going forward so i would be positive uh, don't write it off so easily just on the basis of a broad softness in in, in expectations mm. uh prakash hi morning uh, did you look at the bank of baroda numbers i mean the stock sold off uh, actually uh, you know the 5% cut ended i think about 3 3 and a half lower uh but uh, generally numbers seem quite okay good morning prashant so this is uh, you know if you if you uh, look at what happens it's a question of uh, uh, anecdotally it's it's about timing at times sbi came up with numbers which were so stellar and when bank of baroda which is the you know second best in that class uh, uh stands up and starts uh, showing its earnings you know you start sensing that there is a little bit of a disappointment because there's an immediate comparison if you go back 3 4 days and you see canara bank numbers uh you know they were they were so interesting the kind of uh, you know uh, expectation management that there uh, you see the management on its call doing is again you know trying to make people believe that things are going to be not as uh, great as what's you know uh, being penciled in from the price perspective but a nim of 3.5% uh, 3.4% uh, kind of write backs that they're ta- taking 6000 crores every year i i don't see any reason why these banks uh, would have to be looked at with any any uh, softness in the price to book multiples you know and uh, from bank of baroda's perspective i i i can tell you that there are a lot of positives that would start showing up in the next few quarters now that the rbi uh, clearance has been given to them but how quickly they can take advantage of that is a big question so i have always had some issues with bank of baroda in terms of execution but canara bank stands out as as probably the best uh, in class out there after sbi so i would i would rather look at something which is far more promising uh, with certain triggers uh, packed in okay all right thanks sir for that prakash we'll come back to you in a bit we just need to take a short sure. break up next we have sudarshan sukhani and mitesh thakkar who will join in for some technical trades so do stay tuned in for that Okay, welcome back. Uh, you with us here on Bazaar Morning Call. The pre-open is on your screen, about 37 points lower. The gift nifty that is. We are about 10 minutes away from the pre-open uh, session, so slightly softer start uh, is what the indicative uh, price uh, shows. But uh, what from here? I mean, on Friday the market defended an important trend line support. Does that mean anything, or will selling come back at higher levels? Mitesh and Sudarshan are with us. to answer that question and uh, tell you what to do gentlemen good morning good to have both of you here thanks very much mitesh how would you look at things this morning morning prashant so i think 21950 has broadly held for the uh, declining sessions of thursday and then we got some bounce back on friday with the low around that 21950 zone uh, the structure for me is very weak until we capture 22200 on the upside i think you will see uh, selling emerge at higher levels what can happen on the downside is that if we start getting below 21950 and uh, give a hourly close or a two hourly close below that then i think you might see uh, the selling kind of accelerate in the short term and we might uh, head towards 21800 which is my first pivot support area and then 21650 which is where a couple of moving, moving averages on the weekly charts are, are merging so these are the targets i am working with on the downside the idea would be to sell closer to about 22200 and try to cover uh, once we see lower levels from there uh, in case we get a bounce back or sell if we see the index break below 21950 okay so darshan sukhani is also with us sudarshan uh, market holding at that 22000 mark do you think we can build on to our gains do you think we can we expected to see more pressure because you know by and large this has been a down trending market in the last couple of weeks you think that trend is something that can continue yeah good morning see on thursday we broke down from significant support levels there was a trading range and that trading range broke on the downside 
Now, the markets will stop falling somewhere, but it's too early to say that this is it and this is the end of the decline. Now, in a small, in a correction of this kind, we just have to wait patiently till markets actually stop falling and start moving sideways. That process has not yet started. That will come about and we'll know about it only when it starts moving sideways and the decline seems to end. The momentum now on the downside stops. But that nothing, none of this has happened. So the Nifty is in a correction. Corrections are very difficult to trade. You can make an attempt to go short, but just half a, an hour of a V-shaped rally will stop you out. So the best trade is avoid the Nifty and focus on stocks. Okay, all right. Good morning, gentlemen. Good to see you, Ben. Uh, Sudarshan, then let's get to the stocks. Tell us, what are you tracking? Sure. See, Bharat Forge had a big uh, up day. Then it's moving sideways. That's normal after a large range expansion. Bharat Forge is a buying opportunity with the stop under 13.35. Britannia has a similar uh, chart, big up move. Now moving sideways, expecting to consolidate. But the up move tells us that there is up momentum on the upside. Buy with a stop under 49.70. Supply is my only intraday short. The stock is actually breaking down from significant support levels. One by one, supports are being broken. Intraday short with a stop above 14.25. And finally, Godrich Properties, which is in a correction of sub kind, is in an uptrend. So maybe this is a buy on dips opportunity. Buy with a stop under 26.50. Okay, all right. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thanks very much uh, for that. Mitesh, what about your picks? So, I still have bias towards FMCG on the long side. So I have two FMCG names, HUL, which has been a recommendation in the last few days. Now can be bought afresh with a stop at 2325 for a target of 2440. And Dabur is on the buy list with a stop at 540 buy here for a target of 570. Uh, that apart, Astral and Disclaimer, we have some futures position. I have some futures position and, and it's a recommendation to clients as well. So there's Western interest. I still have some kind of a breakout on Friday. So buy here with a stop at 2205 for targets of 2370. And ACC is on the sell side. Keep a stop about 2406. Look for targets of 2260. Okay, thanks for that. Well, let's do one thing. Let's get some FNO cues out of the way as well. Chandan Taparia joins in. He's a derivative and technical analyst at Motila Loswal Financial Services. Chandan, hi, good morning. Your thoughts on uh, the market and what are the stocks that you're looking at today? Good morning. Uh, Nifty has been making lower top, lower bottom from last couple of days. And now it has come to the lower bend of the rising channel. So technically, the supports are shifting lower. The market setup is turning slightly on the bearish side. But we are near a key support zone in the market. The important part is that India Vix has seen the sharp spurt in the last couple of days. We have seen a swing from 10 to 19 level. So rising volatility with comparatively holding lower put call ratio indicating that bears are dominating the market sentiment. So as of now, 22 to 22 is an immediate hurdle. Market has to cross and hold above the same, then only the stability will be big. Otherwise, index has potential to retest the previous low of 21,800 to 21,700. So I'll play the range in between 21,700 to 22,222 with the view that 22,222 will be a key trigger to decide the market setup. Now, looking at the Bank Nifty index, it is also making lower top, lower bottom, holding below is 50 demo. So 47,777 is a key hurdle. Till it holds below the same, some more profit booking decline could be there in the red sensitive index. Now, looking at the stock wise, Positive view on the selective auto consumptions and uh, fashion related names. So first it is buy on ABFRL. The stock has respected uh, its previous support of 245 and holding well above its 50 demo. Uh, it is trading well above its volume weightage average and longs are being added. So recommending to buy with support of 250 and expecting a move towards 270 level. Second trading idea that is buy on Asher Motor. The stock is holding well, Nifty Auto is doing well. We have positive view on most of the auto name, including Maruti, Tata Motors, Hero Moto, Asher Motor. So we are, here we are recommended to buy on Asher Motor. The stock has given a highest daily close. Resilience at the time of market decline, holding the support zone. So recommending to buy with support of 4580, looking for an upside move towards 4880 level. Last area that is buy on Hindustan Unilever. Selective FMCG stocks are doing well. And HUL has negated its lower top, lower bottom on the weekly chart. Uh, it has uh, seen some short covering activity, surpasses immediate hurdle. So momentum led by short covering could be seen in the counter. One can buy with support of 2320 and HUL has potential to move to us 2470 zone. All right, uh, Chandan, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much uh, for those calls. Appreciate it.
uh, very much here on CNBC TV. We'll take a quick commercial break here. We are back and we get chatting with the management of GE Shipping. We discuss their fourth quarter numbers and uh, more importantly, what F525 is going to look like. Stay tuned. Well, the voting for the fourth phase of the 18th Lok Sabha elections will take place today in 96 seats across nine states and one union territory. Some major states like Bihar, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, West Bengal, Uttar Pradesh and Jharkhand will go to polls. So what is at stake? We have all our reporters standing by to tell us the mood on the ground. First up, let's go to Jude who is joining in from Hyderabad. Jude, good morning. Well, good morning. As you can see, Hyderabad has come out in healthy numbers to vote. You're seeing two separate lines right behind me waiting to cast their vote. We're coming to you, uh, you know, from the neighborhood in central Hyderabad where you're seeing uh, an Asaduddin OIC, a long-time MP from the city, take on Madhavi Lata, who is, of course, the challenger from the BJP. Let me give you a bit of a glimpse in terms of the lines that we're seeing here. You are seeing... Many Hyderabadis queue up from early hours in the morning to cast their polls. Remember, all 17 seats from Telangana will go to vote today. Uh, the issues are varied, but the fact remains that there's a whole lot of momentum, one might argue, in favour of the Congress, especially given the fact that the party won a resounding assembly victory just last year. Uh, but in a nutshell, really, some key seats are mainly Hyderabad, Secunderabad and Warangal, even as a number of issues face voters from these constituencies. But even as we bring you these visuals from Hyderabad, a number of long-time voters, several senior citizens have also made their way to cast their vote. What we have been seeing is all three sides, remember the BRS, the Congress and the BJP are locked in a three-way contest. All three parties have been evincing a fair bit of confidence in so far as polling is concerned. But the fact remains that even as polling continues, as far as the elections are concerned, there are nine out of 17 seats as far as the BRS is concerned, even as the Congress and the BJP hold about four and three seats respectively in so far as the 2019 numbers go. But in terms of where we go from here, the fact remains that a fair bit of anti-incumbency and momentum will be the order of the day, even as all three parties are locked in a three-way contest. All right, uh, Jude, thanks very much. And it's going to be an interesting one, right, from down south. Uh, so we'll uh, sort of come back to you and, of course, get to other reporters uh, from other parts of the country as well. Santhya, a colleague, is in Bihar. And uh, she'll get us more details uh, from what's happening there. That's, again, of course, an interesting contest there. Uh, well, uh, Prakash, I think, is still with us. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, Prakash, I mean, of course, with politics, uh, we'll know when we know, which is, of course, going to be the first week of June. Uh, but uh, Mitesh was earlier telling us about, uh, I mean, one of his trades was from the FMCG space. Now, that is the sector, or stocks from that space, did between 4 to 6%. You know, HUL, Marico, Dabur, Nestle, I mean, that looked like it was coming back into some sort of momentum. Any thoughts there briefly and uh, if, you, if you have a pick, something you like? No, absolutely. I'm, uh, I'm glad you uh, brought this up, Prashant, because, you know, when uh, we were anticipating numbers to come through last week and, and Dabur uh, was the one that I was very closely watching, you know, because simple, this thing is, it has a significant uh, rural exposure and it has a little bit of uh, a crossover on the staple side as well. So, you know, if you look at those numbers, uh, my sense is that the bottoming out phase is over in terms of demand. Uh, so whatever demand uh, slowdown that we saw is is probably now uh, past us. And, and, you know, the HUL numbers also tell you that uh, whatever volume degrowth that we have seen uh, is, is probably not something which you could kind of anticipate any continuation in. Now, whether, whether this uh, you need to wait for the monsoon to kind of start uh, triggering a demand revival or not, that's a big question. But the anticipation of a good monsoon will probably bring, bring, uh, you know, start kind of getting priced into these uh, stocks. The other stock that I'm watching very carefully is ITC for the simple reason that within the FMCG pack, uh, you know, there is, there is nothing else which is better poised in terms of resilience. Uh, it has a tobacco business. Now it also has a hotel business kind of shaping up for the demerger. 
and then of course you know the the, the uh, fast moving consumer good segment also is kind of doing fairly well so it, it's a stock that's got ignored someday somebody will start getting interested at 430 435 and start looking at the kind of promise that it holds so i don't see any reason why these stocks will not come back and and the flight to safety in the volatile times that we are seeing will probably make it even better for these uh, names but dabar and itc uh, absolutely stand up okay uh, well, you know, uh, Prakash, I also want your thoughts on GE Shipping because we have the company joining us now. But I'll just invite you to listen into that conversation first. Um, the company reported a good performance in Q4. The revenues were at a multi-quarter high. Margins improved sequentially. Their gross debt has also declined. G. Shivakumar, who is the executive director and CFO of GE Shipping, joins us now to talk about that. Uh, Mr. Shivakumar, after three consecutive quarters of a decline in revenues, you've finally seen a 3% year-on-year growth. Um, can you tell us how much was on account of firming up of rates and how much was on account of the volumes that you handled and what is the expectation for FY25 in terms of growth? Morning, Sonia. Uh, it's mostly to do with rates uh, rather than the volumes that we handled. Our operating days haven't changed uh, in any significant way. Our capacity remains more or less the same as it was in the previous quarters. So it's basically the rates which changed. So we saw the product tankers uh, rates spiking uh, in the Jan March quarter. Uh, crude tankers also did strongly. And that's really what led to the improved performance and all of these disruptions. And the spike was probably caused by the disruption that you see in the Red Sea, which led to uh, ships having to take the long route around Africa. So what is the outlook since you're saying that mostly the growth is to do with rates, right? What is the outlook on rates under the current geopolitical issues? And what is the impact that it has had on trade activity? If you can give us some numbers. Yeah, so trade activity uh, in terms of volumes moved hasn't really uh, changed. What happens is that the ton miles change. So which means that you have to transport uh, goods over longer distances, which means that demand for ships goes up. Uh, so that's what is happening. If these don't reverse, then you'll have the market continuing to remain tight. Again, uh, that's on the miles aspect of the ton miles. The tons are dependent on macro and uh, trade patterns. And macro, you will know better than we do what's happening on macro. Mm -hmm. Hi, good morning, Mr. Shiv Kumar. Uh, Nigel on this side, and good to see you in. You know, I wanted to focus on the offshore vertical. I recall many quarters ago, I was asking you about when does it turn around? Now it's turned around and it's turned around in style. Now your rigs, they come up for renewal in the first half and the second half of the year. The current rates for rigs are anything around, you know, eighty-five dollars to $90,000. That compares with around the $50,000 of rentals, which G's rigs are currently working at. So my question to you is, would that mean that we'll see a big improvement in the top line for the offshore vertical and almost all of it flows down to the bottom line? Uh, last question first. Uh, if there's an improvement in rates, most of it will flow to the bottom line. Uh, cost inflation is there, but that's very small compared to the price improvements that uh, that uh, that we are seeing. Uh, just one thing, there has been a recent setback in the rig market. Uh, okay. You would have seen Saudi Aramco's announcement that, uh, you know, that they're going to scale back the target of 13 MBD that they had set for themselves. Uh, and uh, back to 12 MBD, which was their earlier target. And after that, they have suspended contract for 22 Chaka Creek so far. A small change in sentiment uh, internationally. Again, it's nothing to do with our market, uh, but there's been a small change in sentiment internationally. We haven't seen lower pricings as a result of that. It's just a sentiment thing. We are still awaiting our contracts for our rigs. There are two tenders. There was. Uh, there were two tenders under process. One of them has got cancelled in India, that is. Mm -hmm. uh, these were three-year contracts. Uh, so we are just seeing what options we have there. Okay. All right. Now, so I just want to focus a little bit more on this offshore vertical, though. Give and yeah. take everything they are talking about. Sentiment has got a bit of a knockback, but rig rates are still much higher than what it was in the past quarter. On a quarterly basis, you're doing 90, 95 crores of EBIT only from this segment. So that's likely to go up substantially, right, on a quarterly basis. If you want to give us a number for the year, last year offshore was around 1,100 crores with a bit of around 160 crores. This year it's going to look much better, right? Give us a broad number just on this vertical. 
Yeah, so the offshore business, broadly your message is correct. Every pricing, and I mentioned this in the past, every pricing that we have, every repricing that we have, whenever some asset, whether it's a vessel or a rig, comes up for repricing, is getting priced at a higher rate than the previous contract. So if an offshore vessel was being uh, was on contract at five five and a half thousand dollars a day, the repricing is happening between nine and eleven thousand dollars a day. So we're talking between fifty and hundred percent increase in uh, increase in pricing. So your broad uh, conclusion is correct that rates are increasing, profitability is improving significantly. I think it's bottomed out a couple of years ago. Last year we were back to profitability, and I think that trajectory should continue. Again, always assuming that the rig contracts happen because rigs really are the big revenue contributors. And we have two rigs coming off contract this year. And assuming that they get recontracted, then that trajectory should continue. Mm. Uh, Mr. Shiv Kumar, hi, morning. Uh, sorry, uh, how many how many rigs do you have and how many are operating at this 5,000 and how many, are, how many will go to this 9,000, 10,000, which you said? Oh, those are the vessels that we're talking yes. about. Uh, yeah. So those are 19 vessels that we have. We have okay. 12 vessels, uh, 12 or 13 vessels, which are up for repricing in this year itself. Okay. Uh, and uh, most of them are operating uh, at, so. and 5,000 is just an example that I gave. Some of them are operating at those levels. But mm -hmm. yes, we would get a pricing improvement of at least three to $4,000 a day on each contract repricing that happens. Okay, this is the uh, these are the vessels uh, repricing that you're talking vessels. about. On the rigs, we operate four rigs, uh, yeah. one of which has got repriced at a high rate, the uh, rate similar to what Nigel mentioned uh, earlier, and two of them are coming up for repricing in this year. So we'll wait and see what happens with those repricings. As I said, those are the big impacts really, because uh, you know going from forty-five to eighty thousand dollars is a big impact. Okay. Mr. Shivmar, what is the uh, overall uh, sort of company-wide F525 uh, top line going, going to look like? I mean, if you can give us a broad sense right now, uh, as we stand right now, of course, a lot could lot could change. But what's your estimate? So we don't make estimates uh, ourselves. Even internally, we don't make estimates because, as I said, uh, about eighty percent of our capacity is exposed to the spot market in shipping, and that's why we don't uh, we can't even make estimates because the spot market is extremely volatile uh, and. Uh, so we don't make those estimates. All we can say is the market looks like it's remaining firm at these levels. We don't see what's going to stop this the strength in the market except for a macro event. Okay. Uh, we leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, you know giving us a view on your business and the way forward. Let's get back to the market now. We have uh, Sudarshan Sukhani joining in to give us a 9-10 call for the day. Sudarshan, what are you looking at? Buy Britannia with a stop under 49.70. Okay, and Mitesh, what about you? I'll go with a buy on HUL for targets of 24.40. All right, uh, let's take a look at Tata Motors as well this morning because that's definitely going to be in focus on the back of its numbers and the commentary from the management. Now, there are two downgrades that have come in on Tata Motors today. So, let me just take you through that. Um, the ones I've chosen are Nomura, which has downgraded the stock to a neutral. They have a target price of 1141 on Tata Motors. They say that the commercial vehicle growth will be moderate going forward. Jaguar Land Rover could face demand risks. JLR is targeting an EBIT margin of 8.5% in FY25, which is flat year on year. So no improvement there. There are rising risks to the global auto demand. And the stock is now in a fair value zone at 5.4 times FY26 EV2 EBITDA. Uh, Morgan Stanley has also downgraded Tata Motors this morning to an equal weight. They have a target price of 1100 They say that there's nothing wrong with the business. Tata Motors has delivered on all major targets. Execution is strong. Business is performing well. But a lot of the good news is priced into the stock. They talk about rising competitive intensity in the passenger vehicle business, both on the India EV side as well as Jaguar Land Rover globally. So there are some cautious uh, comments coming in on Tata Motors. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Sonia. Well, uh, let's focus on ABP. Last week as well, we had highlighted that it was seeing interesting action. The numbers were superb. Bamakshi joins us to tell us more. Bamakshi. 
Well, absolutely a fabulous set of numbers from ABV India, I would say. Uh, a strong beat across the board in terms of revenue, EBITDA, as well as the net profit. Revenue has come in nearly 7% higher for the counter, coming in at 3,080-odd crores. And this growth is largely being led by the electrification up nearly 30%, process automation up nearly 73%. And this more than offset the temporary sluggishness that we saw in motion as well as robotics and discrete automation. When you look at the margins, we were working with a number of around 14%. And the margins have actually come in much higher at 18.3%. On a year-on-year -year basis, margins have improved by almost 650 basis points. And there, as of now, there seems to be no sort of one-off in the margins as well. Net profit has also seen a very sharp uptick of almost 400, uh, of almost 88%. Net profit has come in 38% higher than what we were expecting at 460 odd crores. When we look at the order inflows, they're strong too at uh, 3,607 odd crores, up nearly 14.6%. Uh, in fact, we have notes coming in from UBS as well as Jefferies. UBS has maintained its buy rating and raised the target price to 8,830, while Jefferies has also raised its target price to 8,845 per share. Okay, thanks for that. Lupin is also in focus this morning. Ekta is here to tell us why. Ekta, over to you. Thanks for that. Well, important news for Lupin because the US court has lifted a temporary restraining order on the drug Mirabigron ER tablets or MyBetric generic. Now, the US court had uh, denied the pharma company Astellis's request for a prelim preliminary injunction on this particular drug. And shipment of the product has resumed for Lupin. So, what basically had happened is that Lupin had launched the drug in April 2024. There was a TRO or a temporary restraining order which was put, which is now lifted. Now, the size of the 25 mg and the 50 mg version of this drug is around $700 million. It's used for overactive bladders. They expect Lupin to probably launch the 50 mg variant of the drug in the first half of FY25. That is basically the street is expecting that. As of now, they are going to relaunch the 25 mg version. So, analysts are estimating that uh, Lupin can make anywhere between $50 million to even $110 million from this opportunity based on which version they launch. If it's only 25 mg, then the opportunity will be lesser. But if it's both the MGs or both the versions, then the opportunity can go up to even $100 million, like I mentioned. Um, and Zydus too uh, would be... All right, I think Ikta, we'll leave it there. We'll just come back to you for more details. But the market open is on your screen. We're starting at 22,055 on the Nifty. And this is an absolutely uh, flattish start. I mean, on the Nifty, there's nothing, no change at all. The Sensex is down 100 points, 72,550. That's about 118, 120 points lower. Mid-cap index is starting uh, 90 points down. You've got the, uh, the small cap index, which will come up on your screen as well. And I think there as well, uh, there perhaps is a little bit of uh, sort of red uh, at this point in time. But uh, the basic broad rates on indices are not very much changed. Uh, so Nifty is down at 22, back at 22,000, 46, 47 points lower. So start of a Monday, start of a new week as well. But uh, stocks with Sonia, she's standing by. Sonia. Well, thanks a lot for that. Let's take it straight to Tata Motors because although the numbers were, uh, you know, slightly below street estimates, it's the management commentary and the caution on demand going ahead. No growth for JLR and FY25 on the EBIT margin front is something that's spooking the street. Multiple downgrades coming in this morning. So Tata Motors is down almost 4.5% right now, the big stock in focus. The company says they remain cautiously optimistic on domestic demand and they expect the first half of the year to be relatively weaker. Aisha Motors was not a bad performance, actually a strong performance in line with estimates. Perhaps the stock is seeing some profit-taking as we speak. ABB India reported very strong numbers, so uh, the revenue growth was driven by the electrification and the process automation segment. ABB India is your big stock right now, almost 7% higher now. And look at that, both volume as well as price action is what we're seeing on ABB India this morning. Let's take it straight to some of the broader market players. You have names like Kalyan Jewelers. Uh, now, the numbers were strong, no two ways about that, but I think uh, the revenue growth was fine, about 34%. I think some bit of disappointment on the margin front and hence the stock is down about 1.1% as we speak. Piramal Pharma had a strong set of numbers, so 3.5% higher on this stock, picking up pace both on volume as well as on price action. Thermax had a strong set of numbers as well. Okay, first we have BEML, so let's get that on board. 2.5% higher on BEML. The margins up 400 basis points year on year. I'd like to see the chart of Thermax as well and how that one is performing this morning because for Thermax, the earnings were quite strong this time around, but the stock is largely flat with a bit of a negative bias. 
Let's now take it to VIP Industries because it recorded a double digit growth for the first time in three quarters. But the street is still quite circumspect, so 5.5% lower here. Profit taking is what we're seeing on VIP Industries. Let's move to some of the pharmaceutical names. Lupin, Ekta was telling us that there's positive news where the US court has lifted the temporary restraining order on uh, Mira Begron ER tablets. So Lupin is up about 1 odd percent. And in terms of earnings today, there are a couple of these, you know. Um, non-index favourites that are, are going to be delivering numbers. There's Zomato, uh, there's also JSPL and UPL that will be uh, d uh, coming out with earnings. But Zomato is the one in focus, right? Everyone wants to see what Blinkit has been doing considering the strong performance there. Ahead of numbers, Zomato is up 1.5%. But for the market, this really is, you know, the area to focus on. 90 points lower now on the index, given up on the 22,000 mark with a lot of ease down half a percent and look at the advanced decline ratio as well now it's even stevens but look like it looks like it's trending more in favor of declines which is not a good thing and that's something that the market is going to look at very closely nigel back to you all right thanks a lot for that uh, sonia well a few stocks uh, that are in focus you know last week we had told you that abb the price action was telling you that the street was sensing something you know, a year on bazaar itself. And the stock has opened up with a gain of around 6.5%. Those numbers look good. We'll have to wait by for the con call details. It's not cheap, but for the time being, flying away. There are a few earnings disappointments, though. Take a look at uh, Newland Labs. That stock is down 10% as we speak. Big selling pressure out there. So sharp downtick is what you've seen on Newland Labs. I think on the margins, there was a bit of a disappointment. So Newland Labs has taken a knock. Bank of India as well is down nearly around 9% now. So big selling pressure being seen on that one as well. Stock pulling back big time. Union Bank as well is down close to around 3% as we speak. So quite a few calamities is what we're seeing. A couple of other notable uh, losers in trade today. TCI Express is down close to around 5%. So it seems the street didn't like those numbers. So that stock is well lower. Uh, JTL Industries, the stock is down close to around 6 to around 7% approximately. We already have the cheat sheet with regard to volumes. But uh, the numbers, in fact, are quite uh, weak. So that stock is well down close to around 7%. And the sector itself had got hit. Because tubes, you know, the kind of uh, demand that we're seeing is not as much as anticipated. Getting into elections, there is a bit of a slowdown. So JDL is lower. You have Apollo, uh, APL Apollo as well. That's under some pressure. So that stock is pulling back a, a little bit uh, to kickstart trade. Two gainers that were big gainers actually in uh, Friday's trading session was Dr. Lal's as well as Polycap post their numbers. It's building onto the gains now. A couple of upgrades that are coming there. So Dr. Lal is up closer on 5%. Polycap as well is up closer to around 4% as we speak. And Pyramid Pharma, another one that we highlighted last week on Bazaar, the price action was telling you the street was sensing something. Volumes were massive. That's the other big gainer. So Pyramid Pharma and ABB India, both of them the top gainers in terms of result reactions. But otherwise, plenty of stocks reacting negatively. Well, it's 80 points down on the Nifty. So 21,975 is where we are at on the index. And uh, that's the rate on the Nifty. And it's telling you something, isn't it? We're uh, down about, what, 1,200 stocks down and about 900 stocks which are higher. And uh, it is looking a little uh, sort of uh, troubled right now, uh, the market overall. Let me uh, sort of look at a few other names before we sort of uh, go any further. Uh, so Bank of India is down 10%. It's the second largest volume-led loser across the board. Uh, so that's a sharp, sharp cut coming through there. And then Union Bank. Union Bank, of course, the management we will be speaking with a little later here on the program. It's down 3% right now. Uh, JSW Energy had a big move up, so I think it's just course correcting a little bit. 2%, 2.5% down right now. Uh, there is a JTL Industries, which is down 9%. But I mean, I could look at more stuff. Volumes are down. Volumes are very low. Kalyan Jewelers, earnings 2% lower. Action Construction stocks such a big performer. Uh, four and a half down. Excite is down about two and a quarter percent, but no volumes. VIP reported numbers, for example, VIP Industries, the luggage maker, down five percent. Uh, CAMS, of course, we spoke to recently, post numbers, that is also down. Uh, but no volumes on a lot of these names. Maybe things will pick up a little bit on the upside. Uh, UPL is up four uh, percent, so 520 on UPL, very large volumes right now. And Lal Path Labs, again, another company we'll be speaking with in just a bit. Uh, is up 6.5%. So 2,500 plus on Lal Path Labs is what you have. There is Siemens, BEML, uh, and uh, Wellspun Cop. All of them are up about 3, 3.5%, three 4% as well. And something like a Sharda Kropkem is up about 8.5% uh, as well at this point in time. So 100 points down. On the index, it's not looking very uh, good, but uh, I mean, it is a vibrant kind of start at least to begin the day.
Rana, Gupur, uh, Rana Gupta is uh, with us, uh, Senior Portfolio Manager, Manual Life Investment Management. Uh, Rana, good to have you with us here. Good morning. Thank you for your time. Prashant, this side. So what is, uh, w what's worrying markets, uh, Rana, in your opinion? FIIs have been very large sellers through the course of May, actually even before that as well. Uh, is it, and it looks like it's kind of local here, right? Because globally, markets aren't doing all that badly. Uh, actually, a couple of markets in Asia have sort of hit new highs, etc. So, uh, just your thoughts first uh, on that one. Uh, good morning, Prashant, and good morning to our viewers. I think the global construct looks quite good because uh, even the US market is doing well, it still looks like China is also coming back a bit. But I think India specific, uh, you know, given the election going on and the results are probably, you know, not probably results are three weeks away. Uh, I think uh, the, 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 for the FIs to make a big commitment, as of today, I think, you know, there can be some, you know, they can be just wait out for the election results or maybe even the policy post the results. But apart from that, I think what we have seen in India is the industrials, real estate, PSUs having a big rally and the valuations were stretched as well. So I think we are seeing a bit of profit taking as well as I think there is a lot of uh, speculation at this point in time, one can say, but I think also uh, some forward looking thinking that going forward, uh, there has to be something, something done to revive consumption or the revenue expenditure of the government, which has lagged investment expenditures, should claw back somewhat. So to that extent, one can say that some sort of sector rotation is also going on in the market. Okay. Uh, Rana, hi, good morning and thanks a lot for joining in. So, you know, there's definitely some trepidation ahead of the election results. As you said, there's some sector rotation going on in the market as well. But post-election results, right, uh, taking two scenarios. One, where the incumbent government comes back to power in a dominant way, which is, I guess, the ideal scenario for the market. And the second, where they don't get as many seats as they would have expected. And this is something that the market is fearing. In both these cases, how do you expect the market to shape up post-elections? Great. I think to answer that question, let's take a step back and look at what are the, what have been the hallmark policies of this, to gov this the current government. It has been on the fiscal consolidation and increasing capex. So the capital expenditure has grown much ahead of the revenue expenditure. Should they come back with a thumping majority, we would expect more of the same to continue. And in that case, I think the industrials, real estate, and the PSU stocks which have been correcting, they might even bounce back. But uh, should they come with a, a lower number, but still, uh, still, uh, still from the government, uh, I think the markets will think that uh, markets, of course, speculate that how the politicians interpret this uh, policy. But I would say even then. Uh, even I don't know how the politicians will look, uh, interpret the verdict, but even then, I think the capex to GDP is already at a level of three and of three point four percent. Is freakish. I think it's very difficult to move it further from here. Going forward, it has to be taken over by private capex. So that's one. So private capex plays are I think something to look, look, look at. And second, I think given in as well mentioning the beginning of this uh, of the of this call that the, the revenue expenditure lacked the capital expenditure by a large margin. I think uh, if the numbers are to be seen, CAFEX uh, has grown probably at mid-teens, whereas the revenue expenditure at single digits. That wide gap for three or four years, I think, has happened. Going forward, we can look at some mean reversion for both. So that is also something that uh, we are looking at. Mm. No, so and do what they, uh, in that sense, I mean, actionable, uh, Rana? So I think uh, let's say let's uh, let's uh, let's say the scenario that I just laid out kind of plays yeah. out. Where who comes to power with whatever number of seats, uh, CAFEX to GDP sort of picks out, and you see revenue expenditure to GDP starts creeping up. That yeah. gap somewhat narrows. In that case, one would think that the that 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 rural focused autos, rural focused lenders which have been out of favor for quite a while, right? Quite a while, can start making a comeback. I see, mm. I see. Uh, but I mean, there's, you know, uh, uh, right now, we'll only, of course, all of this is all conjecture, right? We'll only know yeah. uh, on the 4th of June when, uh, when, the, when the votes are counted in that sense. Uh, you know, this, this constant FII selling, do you think it is just some rotation because of high valuations, etc.? You know, whenever uh, 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 China's uh, sort of uh, looking has been looking a little better, so there's that relative trade as well, which many have spoken about. Do you think it is just that, or is this 
I mean, should we see these very large cell flows as uh, kind of a kind of an indication of uh, real nervousness around these around these poles? I just wanted to get a sort of quick perspective on the f FII uh, uh, selling that we've been seeing, Rana. In your opinion? Sure. So I think first point is there is no. Uh, I think uh, it's difficult for FII to come with large amount of money defending the election. I think more than election, one will also have to wait for the policy of the new government in terms of you know what they lay out. Uh, there is a lot of buzz around 100 day final budgets and so on and so forth. At the same time, we have seen some recovery in China. You know, in the earlier shows, I have mentioned that China will see some recovery provided they do something about the export and the real estate. It does seem that they have done something of the real estate. In the last volume meeting, they spoke about finishing the unsold inventory, which is somewhat of a change from public focus on public housing so far. So as a result, uh, this market seeing some recovery. And obviously, China, because the underperformance had become quite cheap. So I think that's some, some sort of rotation going on at the moment. Okay. Uh, Rana, fair enough. Thank you for being with us. Uh, and hopefully, we'll get more clarity on which way the markets head post the elections. For now, there's definitely some jitters in the market. So the Nifty is below the 22,000 mark. It's almost a 100-point cut, not looking good at all this morning. The Bank Nifty is down about 166 points. So perhaps the market is pricing and maybe uh, the incumbent government not coming to power in a dominant way. Perhaps these are the fears that the market is looking at. Let's see which way it goes. For now, there's definitely some trepidation. The mid-cap end of trade is what you should be looking at, uh, you know, um, with a square focus, considering that the broader end of the market is getting a bit more jittery right now. But let's talk about Thermax, which reported a very strong set of earnings. The company registered a revenue growth of 20% led by the industrial products business, which is 23% of the business, and the infrastructure segment. Green solution segment has also seen a 72% surge year on year. Ashish Bhandari, who's the MD and CEO of Thermax, joins us now to talk about that. Mr. Bhandari, thanks a lot for joining in. Uh, can, you, can we start with the industrial infra business, right? It contributes highest to your revenues but it has the lowest margins. Any um, headroom for improvement in this particular segment? Good morning and thank you for having me on the show. Uh, yes, there is a headroom for improvement and based on the profitability of the industrial infra, uh, substantial uh, room for improvement. Mm -hmm. This is the portion of our business where we do EPC projects and especially on, on larger projects, uh, our history of delivering profitability has not been as good as we would like. And which is why there has been a focus on taking uh, measured growth in this area and focusing more on profitable uh, orders coming in, uh, which for the past uh, few quarters has uh, not been that easy. As we get into this year, uh, one of the areas that we would like to improve on is getting more large orders. There is some visibility and making sure that these large orders are profitable and additive to the max. Okay. So this industrial infra business, right? Your EBIT margins uh, have been in this range of 6%. I mean, in this quarter, you saw about 6.08%. Uh, so when you say that there is more scope to improve, can you get to double-digit margins, uh, say, in FY25, FY26, for industrial infra particularly, or is that uh, too tall an ask? I think FY25 uh, difficult, but as we go forward, uh, maybe not double digits, but definitely much better than the numbers that we have currently. Um, and as I said, I would also like to see more growth coming in from this area. Uh, we have had now a few quarters of uh, not as many large orders coming in. So FY25 and 26, I would like to see that order book on large orders also improve. All right, Ashish, morning, uh, Prashant here. And that's interesting because I remember uh, last few interactions, you've been saying how, you know, this uh, it's smaller orders, but, I mean, it's coming from so many different sectors. It's more varied, and in that sense... Uh, but isn't that a good thing, Ashish? I mean, large, lumpy orders are kind of prone to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, smaller, more disaggregated order book is always better? <laughs> I'm not asking one or the other. I'm asking for You're both. You're asking for both. <laughs> uh, for both, yeah. And... Uh, which is our industrial products business, which is a lot more diversified, multi-segment, uh, multi-industrial uh, growth. There yeah. you can see we have had steady uptick, and that's the story we've been pushing, services, consistent growth, and we've been delivering that. That portion of the business has improved on profitability as well. A couple of our international businesses are also better than what they've been in the past. 
Uh, we would like to see that trend continue. Um, on the larger orders, uh, we would like to see uh, some uptick. And, and I'd said that, yeah, especially refining and petrochemical, which is the single biggest contributor, we haven't seen much. But as I get into this year, um, we see a bigger pipeline at least in in steel, in power, and then uh, uh, refining and petrochemical also coming back. Uh, you know, we were just we just uh, were earlier speaking with another company uh, on the shipping side, and they were talking about the rigs and offshore vessels, etc. And they were talking about the Saudi ramdown. LNT, for example, is somebody we spoke to last Friday, and they also spoke about their Saudi exposure. Of course, that's very large for them. Uh, or, you know, just is there any impact across your various businesses uh, because of what we what we are likely to see uh, in in uh, Saudi and uh, Ramco and you know, that city which was being built out, etc. Mm -hmm. And just talk sure. to us about in both your uh, sort of industrial products and green solutions uh, business, uh, what is the amount of deferred orders which were perhaps delayed for finalization, etc. And, uh, you know, the, uh, what, what you expect to close here in these segments in Q1? <laughs> I can't give you Q1 look, but I'll take mm -hmm. uh, all the rest of your questions one by one. Um, international and Saudi, for us, our exposure is low. If anything, I would like uh, our Thermax to have better presence uh, across the Middle East and Saudi in particular, uh, where there is um, in some ways like India, a multi-decade growth which is uh, possible in kind of products that Thermax is, is better at. Yeah? We're not in uh, upstream rigs, etc. Our focus is more uh, midstream, downstream kind of uh, industrial growth. And there, I think um, uh, we can do better in Saudi. And growing Middle East in particular is one of the areas we would like to see more of. Currently, our exposure is very minimal uh, to Saudi. Yeah, that's one right. part. Uh, sorry, you had a follow-on question? No, no, no go, go on, okay. go on, Ashish. Um, uh, so on the on the second part, which is how do I see kind of um, the larger uh, growth across multi-segments, multi-things across India? Am I seeing uh, based on kind of order push-outs, et cetera? There have been order push-outs, especially in a couple of segments which are relating to ethanol, sugar, biofuels, bioenergy, some in the steel industry as well. I don't have a specific number to say because we always have some where the customer is shaken hand, but the order is not placed for one reason or another. In this last quarter, it has been more than um, maybe in previous quarters, uh, possibly because of um, you know people wanting to see how the elections turn out, et cetera. But, uh, but I do expect uh, once some of this is over with, uh, some of that pickup to come back in. Okay, all right. Good morning, Mr. Bandari, and good to see you, Win. Well, give us a few more details. How do you expect uh, the mix to continue, you know, with regard to domestic and exports? What is it at? And how do you see that panning out? And a quick question on margins as well. Do you think double-digit margins is doable for the coming year? Given that input costs, a lot of metal costs have gone up big time. It could be a pass-through, but in the near term, it could cause some bit of a pullback. Um, so let me take both questions, uh, one after the other. First on international, Thermax historically was uh, higher on internationals. Actually, at one point, it was even one-third, 35% of Thermax's business. Over the last uh, few years, the domestic growth has been much higher. As a result, exports have come down to 20-odd percent of our business, depending on, on the quarter. Um, exports are profitable for Thermax. Uh, they're good business. And uh, in this year, I expect the... Um, the exports part of our business to start growing again as a percentage of uh, Thermax's overall business. Uh, we have a good pipeline, a better pipeline than in previous years, um, and and we expect uh, better orders as a as a result. Uh, that was our first question. On the second question, on what should we expect on margins uh, overall as we look into this year, there is commodity pressure. Mm -hmm. There is also pressure from having to build out many of the new energy areas, which will require money to be poured in and uh, some amount of short-term hits to be taken as we look to establish those businesses, our bio-CNG business being an example. Um, so in that sense, I don't think uh, a double-digit profitability is a target. 
I think in every business that we work in, the hope is to, and the expectation and the work done is to continuously work on improving our competitiveness, improving our margins, but a net number, which is all integrated Thermax, is actually not a number that I target internally either. Yeah, the focus is on growing each business, being competitive and continuing to go up uh, the competitiveness curve and, and continuing mm -hmm. to improve. Okay, uh, Mr. Banari, just stay on for a minute. Just need to get the focus back on the markets because it's at the day's low right now. It's almost a 600-point knockdown on the Sensex. The Nifty is down 154 points and the real pressure is seeping into the broader markets. The mid-cap index is down 540 points. So within half an hour, not even half an hour of the market opening, uh, you know, we've seen accelerated pressure and not to mention, uh, not, uh, not to forget the advanced decline ratio, which is almost at 1,800 stocks now on the declining side. You know, just a quick point, uh, Sonia. Nifty is now broken Friday's low. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's a new uh, low and it's also broken below. I mean, I, I don't know if we have that... Uh, uh, we, we should update that uh, a graph that we told you we are putting out all day on Friday, which is essentially, you know, uh, the the all important. I mean, at least a medium term from a medium term perspective, important trend line. The lows are January, the lows in April, and of course the low that we had now as well, which is twenty one nine thirty or so. And uh, you know, we've we're now of course below that level in a substantial way, twenty one nine uh, eight ninety one. The hope was that from those levels, like we've seen in Jan, like we've seen in April, you get to actually see a bit of a uh, move. Mm. Especially provided and given the fact that you had a daily positive close on uh, Friday uh, and we were kind of coming into this particular session with last four or five days, which have been pretty tough for the market overall. Well, you know, just a couple of more points, Prashant. Uh, yeah. The swing low is 21,777. So that's going to be the important mark. That's the on April the, low. Uh, yeah. April low. So that's the important mark. So that's point number one. You don't want that to get to breach. Point number two is the India VIX. You know, in a matter of, uh, I think, 15 sessions or so, the VIX has doubled. It was 10. It's moved to around 20 now. So that's a big spike up that we've seen telling you that the fear index is suggesting that maybe the markets are getting a little bit cautious. And point number three is, you know, on days in last week as well, when we entered lower, the volumes are not very, very high. So that's another point uh, to note as well. There is some lightening of positions out there. But on the days that we've ended low, actually, volumes haven't been very, very uh, large. So just uh, take, keep that in mind, because if the verdict is favorable and the street starts factoring in, that we'll see continuity, then the bounce can be equally strong. So, mm -hmm. you know, just want to highlight those three points. Okay, uh, Mr. Bhandari, uh, just uh, let me just thank you on that note. Uh, sorry, we had to interrupt because the market was sliding a bit. I just wanted you to leave us with one number, which is on the borrowings front, because the borrowings have risen to almost 800 crores right now. What is the debt level that the company is comfortable with over the next one year? Look, we are very, very conservative as a company. Most of this borrowing, actually all of this borrowing, is for um, for setting up the renewables part of our uh, platform where the borrowing is done at an SPV uh, level without any corporate uh, debt and corporate books, records to our corporate books. Uh, the Thermax, uh, uh, Thermax legal entity, which is TL, uh, that will continue to stay debt free. And uh, the, low, the debt that is being taken is specific to those assets specific to those SPVs with very strong financials as per industry norms for the renewables business. So Thermax will continue to be very, very conservative and at the larger level, uh, completely debt-free. All right, uh, Ashish, we leave it there. Great conversation. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank and, uh, you know, we look forward to speaking with you again as you uh, back those larger orders, as you said, there's greater visibility for them. You'd like to do uh, get more of those larger, uh, chunkier uh, orders in F5-25. Well, uh, you know, the market's having a pretty rough day, 160 points lower now. Uh, Dr. Lal Path Labs is the next company that we're going to be uh, speaking uh, to. The stock's up 7%, so it's bucking the trend literally uh, with the market down and uh, Lal Path Labs up very, very strongly. They reported an inline performance in the fourth quarter. Margins have improved, realizations are steady, while test volumes have increased on a year-on-year -year basis. Dr. Om Manchanda is managing director at uh, Dr. Lal Path Labs. He's joining us now to take some questions. Uh, Dr. Manchanda, good morning. Good to have you with us here. Thank you for your time as always. Prashant, this side. Uh, could you uh, sort of tell us two things to begin this conversation with, Dr. Manchanda? One, uh, for F525, what are uh, revenue and margin uh, sort of expectations? What are you aiming for? Uh, and two, you know, the Swasthfit project, uh, I think that has done better than what uh, everyone was expecting. Bundle testing is doing much better than what everybody was expecting. 
uh, you've been sort of guiding the market to uh, for that to get to about 25% uh, of your total. Uh, what's the what's the opportunity there? Can you bundle more tests, more on the specialized uh, testing bit, etc., which can lead to uh, sort of a, fast, a faster volume and uh, sort of uh, you know volume impact for you? Uh, good morning. Uh, let me take your second question first. Uh, I think we are seeing very healthy sort of uh, trends on source feed. Uh, primary reason for that is uh, basically it's a, it's a value for virtually all stakeholders. I would start first with the patients. They see a greater value for money because individual test pricing is pretty high. And if you club them together, they actually see a greater value. It's also a value for uh, medical fraternity because in one go, they are able to test a lot of tests without affecting the affordability part of it. And they are able to make decisions very quickly, which normally used to, uh, test normally used to get prescribed, prescribed sequentially. Now it's actually all in one go. Uh, operationally also for us, it's a great value because it just simplifies our operations. Uh, uh, cost of doing additional tests is not that high. So margin impact is also not that much. I think it's a great value for all stakeholders. And that is one of the reasons why these uh, tests are going up. And on the other side, uh, this uh, behavior... Uh, Dr. Manjana, so sorry, this can now go, this is increased. What's the share now? And this can go up to, I think you're saying between to 30 and 40 percent? See, currently last quarter we did about 24 percent. And I think yeah. one trend we need to observe is the consumer behavior because a lot of screening is happening. People are going for preventive checks. So this definitely can go up initially. We did not think about uh, this kind of contribution coming in that sharply. But I think as we go down the pop setup, my sense is going to grow further. And uh, more specialized testing, uh, et cetera, can also be bundled or, I mean, you've reached the limits of bundling from your so offering. I, these are two completely distinct segments. Uh, the routine tests actually fall in NCDs as well as screening. But the high-end testing is more uh, specialized and illness-driven. I think those kind of things will only happen once the patient actually is in serious needs of uh, these kind of tests. So I don't think they would club, they would get clubbed together, but they will be two different segments. And margins are on uh, the West fit, uh, fit portfolio. I mean, the business that segment and other uh, rest is all um, uh, similar, better. Yeah, it really doesn't impact the margin either favorably or unfavorably. I would say they are very similar. And it's just a volume push in that sense. It's value for money, so it's kind of easier to sell it to the customer. Yeah, yeah. It's actually it's everybody just loves this whole sort of okay. format. Okay. All right. Uh... Good morning, Dr. Manchanda, and congratulations on a solid showing. In the last couple of sessions, the stock is up more than 10%, telling you the street is, is appreciating these numbers that you've given. Give us a few details about the way ahead, though. For FY25, what kind of a growth can you guide us? And I understand that the focus is going to be more on volumes. Pricing, I believe, you want to keep it more or less stable. So give us some clarity on that run. And also, you're looking at you know penetrating into the Tier 3 and Tier 4 cities as well. So what is the strategy on that front? How, do you, how much do you want that to constitute as a percentage of your business? See, for FI25, we are exiting uh, the last year on a, on a sort of a confident note. If you look at our Q4 numbers, they are uh, relatively better than what we have done on an annual basis. Uh, that too also on a base of high price increase last year. We were all a little anxious about what will happen this quarter because we took price increase uh, last year. Uh, despite that, I think 11.1% uh, uh, growth is a pretty healthy growth for us in Q4. And uh, we are very confident of beating this growth on an annual basis as we go forward. And as of now, the plan is not to take any price increase. Uh, okay. uh, as far as tier 3, tier 4 strategy is concerned, we have, been, we have been stating in the past that in our core markets, now we need to go deeper. And markets like UP, Bihar, uh, and, and eastern part of India, we are well placed to go deeper in, in pop setup. All right, Dr. Manchanda, just to clear the air. So for this year, FI25, we look at double-digit revenue growth with margins holding at around this 26% uh, mark. Will that be a fair estimate? Uh, it's a little early for me to say firmly yes, but I, we are very confident that we should be moving in that direction. So that will be the aspiration then? Yes, yes. And you gave us a fair kill on Swashpit, which is around 24% now. Uh, indications are that maybe in the next couple of years, it moves closer to around 30%. Would that be an aspiration as well? I really won't go with this number of 30, but I think we are seeing a sort of a rising trend, but I would definitely feel that uh, the trend will definitely be rising. But is it 30 or lower? I don't know right now. 
uh, but i think 24% definitely will be higher than that okay uh, mr manchanda good morning i actually have answered a lot of our questions so let me get some more stuff out of the way on suburban i wanted to know what were the exit margins like for fy24 what is the kind of growth that you're looking at for suburban in fy25 as well as the margins so suburban for us uh, fortunately q4 was much better quarter than the earlier quarters uh, the margins that we have had in q4 definitely are not representative for the year Uh, though we did about nearly 17 percent, but on an annual basis, I would say about 12, 13 percent is sustainable margin for this organization, this company. Uh, going forward, uh, we are trying to build our network of collection centers in Mumbai as well as rest of Maharashtra. Uh, mm. uh, Suburban enjoys a great franchise in this state, and we would continue to uh, drive growth under this umbrella. So you said 17 percent margins is what you exited in FY24, but you're confident of just 12 to 13 percent sustainable margins. Why is that? Is that because competition sorry, is sorry, rising? Let me correct you. Q4 margin is 17, but annual margin is 12. Okay, okay. So for Q4 it's 17, and annually or oh, you did 12 percent, and that's something yeah. that is sustainable. Yeah, that's what we want to say. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Um, in terms of key metrics like realization per patient, per test, volume growth, etc., what are we looking at? So I think overall, uh, what we are seeing is a lot of interplay between volume growth, which is usually a footfall, patient footfall, and the number of uh, tests that we do. So we mm. plan to actually look at both these metrics together. Uh, I think our our sample growth is pretty good, which is primarily being driven by higher contribution of swast fit. And we will continue to drive tests of our patient growth as much as possible. Mm. Okay. In terms of uh, you know, I mean, since we're talking about Swastvit and all of that, you still have about eight hundred and fifty crores of cash on your books. How do you plan to utilize that? Any areas that you're looking to invest into via the acquisition route? And if yes, anything in this calendar year or next that we can expect? Uh, we actually will follow a balanced approach of using this cash. One is of course dividend payout that we've been doing regularly. we also are investing in our own infra expansion in terms of labs and third of course is definitely we are on the lookout for 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 uh, you know good strategic acquisitions and the reasons are south and west uh, west india right now i don't have anything to share but uh, last acquisition that we did was uh, suburban and we will continue to look for uh, such assets in future as well uh, dr manjana one last question uh, so Uh, from a competitive intensity perspective is all settled down now no no predatory pricing uh, as such intensity still continues to be in terms of number of players in the market but uh, but i think that predatory pricing or deep discounting and all that actually is easing off so i think i would say on the pricing front is competition less but relatively of course number of players are are still there All right, Dr. Um, Manjana, we leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure, and thank you very much uh, for uh, <coughs> sort of being with us. <coughs> uh, so the market uh, <coughs> is down 160 points. So that is sharp and swift uh, as uh, things have uh, come through. Market breadth. Look at that. I mean, you got about uh, what four is to one uh, in favor of declines right now. Uh, and uh, lots of stuff uh, happening let me just take a quick look at the market uh, otherwise as well tata motors of course is down a full 7% now uh, bank of india union bank we mentioned earlier big cuts here newland laboratories is down uh, 13 14% we mentioned this as well prestige estates is down 4% action construction is down 6% suzlon is down 5 just dial vip industries force motors or some of the others names sirma which reported numbers down about 6% as well But again, I mean, that's basically is the limit. The number of stocks with volumes which are selling off in any meaningful uh, kind of uh, way. Uh, there's, uh, of course, action on the upside as well. We just spoke with one of them, Dr. Lal Path Lamps. But I mean, there are other names: ABB, Polycam, uh, Cipla, which is up four and a half, Pyramal Pharma, uh, and uh, HTFC Life, which actually is uh, looking up uh, as well. BEML is uh, looking about four percent higher at this point in time. Uh, so that's the market for you. We'll take a break. We are back with the management of Arthi Industries, and we talk about their fourth quarter numbers on the other side. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. Let's focus on Aarti Industries. Well, they reported a fairly mixed set of numbers. To understand what's the outlook for FY25, Mr. Rajendra Gogri, uh, the chairman and MD of the company, joins us on the show. Hi, Mr. Gogri. Good morning and thanks a lot for joining in. Well, for FY24, you had guided for in a bit of closer under 1,000 crores and you've been able to achieve it. What's the target for FY25? You know, in the past, you've given us this broad range of around 1,400 to around 1,700 odd. You know, I'm looking at one of the sell side reports from Incred. They are saying that they don't believe that 1,500 crores EBITDA is possible for the FY25. You, you want to you wanna clarify on that front? What is the target? Yeah, we continue to maintain our guidance for FI-25 of uh, 1450 to 1700 uh, crores. And uh, we should be mainly led by you know, uh, volume growth both in uh, discretionary as well as um, uh, non-discretionary. And uh, some of our projects also will uh, come on stream, you know, we should drive the EBITDA growth in uh, FI-25. Okay. All right, so you're, you're sticking with that guidance, 1,450 to around 1,700 crores. Or do you think you'll be at the upper end or the lower end, sir? And also, since you mentioned about volumes, what's the volume growth you're targeting for FI25? Yeah, overall volume growth, we are targeting about uh, 20 to 30 percent. And uh, currently, you know, it will be very difficult to you know, fine tune the guidance uh, because uh, we have to see how the actual volume growth uh, takes place. And also the commissioning of the new plant and the ramp up. Uh... Mm. Got it, Mr. Kogri. Uh, good morning, uh, Prashant here. Are you, you know, for you to get to that uh, sort of number that you're guiding, are you st already starting to see signs of this turn in the first quarter, or this is something that we will only see in the? It's going to be back ended uh, in H two. Yeah, actually, it will be a progress. If you see, even in FI24, the progressively EBITDA had increased quarter on quarter. So, same thing, you know, in FI25 also. Basically, you know, we'll see a quarter on quarter uh, increase in uh, EBITDA as the volume uh, growth uh, uh, kicks in. Mm. Okay, so you're saying uh, the FI25 guidance is 1450 to 1700 crores, right, for the full year? Yes, yes. Okay, and on the, um, uh, you know, just to tr uh, try and understand what could be the triggers of growth for you uh, to get to this 1700 crore figure, uh, what, what are the demand trends looking like in the specialty chemicals business, um, you know, how are the export markets looking like, if you can just give us some trends of what the, what would lead to this 20 to 30 percent volume growth that you're looking at? Yeah, you know, the discretionary substantial growth has uh, revived and uh, we expect, you know, going forward uh, near normal uh, for uh, discretionary. Uh, agrochemical industry has, you know, has been guided by so many other companies, uh, still is under stress in volumes. So that I think, you know, uh, by end of uh, calendar year FI24, I think uh, um, agrochemical also should reach uh, near normal. So agrochemical still the pain will uh, continue in FI25 and progr progressively the volume increase will happen. And uh, so, some of the specialty chemical, we are also expanding our uh, plants. So those volumes also, some of the product we expect a sizable growth. Okay. So you said agrochemical will take some time to reach near normal. The pain will continue in FY25 and then perhaps uh, you'll get to normalcy. So when you talk about normalcy in agrochemical, what is the kind of volume growth that you're looking at once the pain subsides? And even specialty chemicals, the API business has been under some stress. So when do you expect that to return to normal growth? And if yes, what would the growth look like? Yeah, this year is going to be a transition, so that we are seeing uh, 20 to 30 percent. And uh, subsequently, you know, also for existing plant and the new plant, which will be commissioned in FI25. So all those ramp up in happen in uh, FI26. So additional, you know, 10 to 20 percent volume uh, growth is expected uh, from our existing product line in FI26. Okay, all right. So you have given us a fair estimate about the operational performance. Let's turn our attention to the balance sheet then. Your net debt is around 3,200 crores, Mr. Gogri. Uh, you have some CAPEX plans. So the peak debt, net debt, will move to how much in uh, in this year? This year, you know, uh, actually, uh, the, our uh, working capital also moves on uh, raw material prices. So that, I think, uh, will be in the range of uh, 
3,400 to 3,800 crores. Uh, that is the range uh, which we are expecting in the next. Okay, it peaks out at those levels. Also, I had another question for you. You know, there's a German pigment uh, maker, UBAC, that filed for bankruptcy. Are these supplies to them? Yes, we supply some intermediates to them. Okay, so uh, well, uh, how will things move then? They have filed for bankruptcy. Is that a risk to your business? And what is the contribution? Or how does the percentage of your total business? How much do they contribute if you want to quantify it in percentage terms, in absolute terms? Uh, they are not a very significant um, customer uh, in uh, value terms. And as far as our debt is concerned, I think that is covered by insurance. So we don't see much impact. Mm. Does it open up opportunities for Indian players in any way? I mean, maybe not you directly, but uh, you know, other pigment players here, etc. Yeah, I think some benefit may uh, accrue to some of the Indian uh, pigment manufacturer, and some will go towards uh, other global manufacturers. Mm. Okay, all right, Mr. Gogri, we'll let you go on that note. Thank you so much for joining us and discussing your performance and the way forward. Well, um, let's do one thing. I think it's uh, time for the Dalal Street debut for Indigene. So, I'm not sure if it has listed yet, but the expectation is that, okay, at about 10 a.m. is when Indigene, the IPO, will be listed. It had a very strong subscription, so expect a good listing as well. It was subscribed over 70 times, Indigene, that is, um, and it raised about 550 crores from an 36 anchor investors. Just look at that. Uh, expected to be a very, very um, a strong listing over there. Now, uh, we'll get to know more about that in a bit. In the meantime, let's take a quick break. Um, okay, before that, Mitesh Thakkar is joining in because I guess the need of the hour is the market, which is uh, the Nifty is down 200 points. Uh, Mitesh, what do you do for the rest of the day? Do you think it could get worse? And if yes, does it make sense at any point to take a fresh short position in the market? I think, you know, as I said, uh, below 21,950, the decline could accelerate to about 21,800 and then 21,650. So I maintain that. I think we are now closer to 21,800. But people can still, you know, take some put option spreads or buy into put options for the May expiry. I think around 21,650 is where I would want to uh, at least cover a good part of my short and see if there's a reversal happening over there. And then I think it's a negative kind of a comment. And I uh, would maintain a sell and rally kind of stand. Now, earlier I'd said, Sell it closer to about 21, uh, 22, 150, 200 zones. Now I think it's shifted down to about 21, 9. Okay. By the way, that's the, the last week debut for Indigene. Uh, let me just get the stock up. List at 655. The issue price was 452. So very, very strong listing, as we've been telling you. Uh, it's a company that is a digital first company that provide, uh, provides um, uh, various solutions. It's a life sciences commercialization company. So it provides different solutions from patent journey design to, pa to patient identification, onboarding, adherence, etc. So it's a largely a digital first company. And the numbers have been very strong. If you look at it in nine months of FY24, Indigene saw revenue growth of 15%. Even in the last three years, right, FY21 to 23, the compounded growth rate for the company has been 55%. So very, very strong uh, debut coming in over there. You know, Sona, just one word from the morning tick. It's down nearly around, I think, uh, 9 to 10% or I think some part of the street was bracing for even better listing actually out there. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a blockbuster listing. No two ways about that. But I think some part of the street, going by the premium that you hear about, you know, is expecting maybe a number closer to around 700 rupees odd. It's a good listing, but maybe a little bit lower to some estimates on the street or some that were factoring in. That's the market for you, Nigel. That's right? the market, I mean, yeah. 200, I mean, 200 points gone now. Uh, so that is a very, very sharp cut. Uh, so 21,833. And this is, I mean, not even the first hour so far uh, of the day. Uh, Midesh, uh, sort of, <clears throat> sorry, just to recap, you're saying... Uh, you, you're revising how you trade the index. Just repeat that for us and we'll get to your stocks. Sure, Prashant. Uh, earlier, you know, and I've, see, I've been maintaining that it's a sell and rallies market and we'll see lower levels. And uh, uh, earlier, the idea was that till we are about 21,950, there's a chance of us getting a bounce back to about uh, 22, 150, 200 zones. That didn't happen. We broke 21,950. So the morning view was that either you sell on rallies or sell below 21,950. Uh, and the selling can be done by, you know, shorting futures or even buying put options or doing some bearish spreads. So we have bought into, uh, we, we have sold into call options. So this summer, there's a vested interest over there. But now I think given the fact that we are below 21,950, that becomes the important pivot. Any pullback will now face significant supply around 21,950 level. So that becomes your fresh selling point or around those levels becomes your fresh selling point. 
The first target is 21,800. We are very close to that. In fact, the low today is 21,828. Uh, 21,800 is a pivot, but if it breaks, and I think eventually we'll head towards 21,650. So the idea is that be negative till we hit 21,650 and then see if there is some kind of a reversal building up over there. But for the timing, I think uh, I would I would hold on to short positions and maybe add if we get closer to about 21. Okay. And uh, what would you trade in terms of stocks, Midesh? Yeah. So on the stock side, I have a sell on NMDC with a stop at about uh, 254 for targets of 235. Again, a stock which has been done extremely well and is now correcting. So would give a stronger pullback. And the second sell is ONGC with a stop at about uh, 268. Look for targets of 250. Mm. Okay. Mitesh, on Bank Nifty also, got that, ONGC and NMDC, Bank Nifty has also broken that uh, February uh, trend line uh, today, right now, as we speak. It's down uh, yeah. three quarters of a percent. So here, uh, where do we get to? Okay, I, I think, Prashant, the important level which I'm watching is uh, 46,500 to begin with. That's the first year level because uh, that's where the weekly averages are merging. And in case we start breaking below that, there's a strong chance of that happening. So I would look at a test of around 45,650 to about 45,700 to begin with and then maybe lower levels, but then we'll take the call as we hit, uh, as, as we get closer to those levels. Okay, thanks a lot, Mitesh, for that. Well, let's do one thing. Let's take a quick break. On the other side, we'll put focus on the commodity space. Manisha Gupta will be joining in. Do stay tuned in for that. Well, equities are not looking good, but let's also give you a quick lowdown on what's happening in the commodity space. Manisha Gupta is joining in. Manisha, what's the one commodity that you're tracking today? Well, I'm looking at the silver prices because this clearly is shining quite bright. If you look at the previous week, we've seen the prices gain up anywhere between 6 to 7% on various time zones there. And with that, we are trading at a three-week highs when it comes to the silver prices. Well, we also are looking at silver taking support from the gold prices, which have seen an all-time highs. Silver clearly has been a laggard, but the gold and silver ratio is something that seems to be working in favor of silver prices right now. Also, when you look at the U.S. data, well, the weak labor numbers, the jobless claims are the highest in eight months, have led to an expectation that you could be looking at the first rate cut coming in from the US in the month of September. We have seen similar statements come in from the Bank of England and the Eurozone as well. Also, when it comes to silver, remember it's part industrial commodity as well, and the booming solar power industry is leading to higher silver demand. There are great numbers that we are working in that sense there. Almost one third of every new silver that is being mined or in sense of inventory, well, that is going into photovoltaics. The global investment in so, uh, so solar photovoltaic manufacturing is seen doubling in 2023 at $80 billion, and the markets are only, only anticipating stronger numbers in this year as well. The, if you look at the global investment, well, that has been on the strong side here. I also want to take you through the prices and what we've seen in this year until now. Well, we started with $23.5 an ounce. We did see the prices decline in the month of Feb. This is when we were looking at weaker Chinese data. But in the month of April, we've seen a three-year highs of $29 an ounce. Now, this is a level that has been a very strong resistance for the silver prices in last couple of years as well. If you look at the previous year, that is 2023, we've done a range of around 25 to 18 on the lower side. 2022 saw 27.9, so almost $28, but $18 an ounce has been a strong support. That's exactly where the cost of making silver also comes in. So that, as of now, holds us very strong support. On the resistance side, as I said, $29 continues to be a very stiff resistance. We've seen an all-time high in case of silver at 47.9. So we're almost half of where we were in April 2011. And the markets do believe that from here on, you could be looking at higher high prices there. If you look at the Indian markets, well, last year was 71,000. Year before was 60,000. We are holding at around 85,000 right now. And 88,000 rupees a kg is an all-time high that we have seen in case of silver prices there. Interestingly, when you look at the imports that have come into India, well, that has been hiking as well. 2022 was an all-time high in sense of silver imports into the country. Last year was lower because we were sitting on a higher inventory. Now, this year in the first quarter, the kind of imports that we have seen are much higher than all of last year as well. So that tells you that the investment demand, industrial demand, all of that seems to be on the higher side. Well, the markets do believe that... Uh, while silver is trading at a multi-year resistance levels right now, but cities, TANC, Bank of America, everybody believes that 30 to $32 an ounce on the higher side is where you could see silver prices in this year itself. Okay, thanks a lot, Manisha, for that. But the stock that is really 
you know, under a lot of pressure right now is Tata Motors. It's down 9% as we speak. Uh, there are multiple downgrades that have come in this morning post the numbers, but the two that I've picked up are from Nomura as well as Morgan Stanley. Nomura has downgraded Tata Motors to a neutral. They have a target price of 1140, which is still above the current market price. But here's what they're saying. They're talking about how commercial vehicle growth will be moderate going forward. JLR, Jaguar Land Rover could face demand risks. They are targeting EBIT margins of 8.5% in JLR in FY25, which is a flat performance. So no growth in JLR margins in FY25 is what the company has guided for. There are now rising risks to global auto demand. And the stock has also run up quite a bit. So it's trading at a fair value of 5.5 times FY26 EV to EBITDA. Morgan Stanley has also downgraded uh, Tata Motors to an equal weight. They have a target price of 1100. They say there's no problem in the business. So Tata Motors has delivered on all its major targets. Execution is strong. Business is performing well. But all of the good news is priced into the stock. And there is a lot of rising competitive intensity, especially in areas like electric vehicles and passenger vehicle space. And on, global, on the global front as well, Jaguar Land Rover is facing a lot of competition. So, you know, that is, those are two big brokerages that have gone ahead and downgraded the stock. But Bank of India is the other one we're looking at this morning. Abhishek is here to tell us why. Abhishek, over to you. Uh, well, uh, good morning, Sonia. So to begin with, you know, slippages are coming back uh, into banking sector, especially with respect to PSU banks, wherein Agri and SME slippages are the talk points of Q4 FI24 results. So slippages have increased 55.5% sequentially. The annualized slippage ratio is at 1.45% versus 0.97% in the previous quarter. The annualized credit cost is at 12 quarter high uh, at about 1.45% versus 0.45% in the previous quarter. Return on asset on account of elevated uh, provision is uh, at five quarter low of 0.61% versus 0.81% in the previous quarter. Advances growth, YOY, it's one of the best in last uh, four quarters coming in at 15.9%. So the NI growth has held up uh, quite well, 7.5% growth YOY at about 8.65% sequentially. The other income, again, all the PSU banks are seeing a fair gain with respect to uh, uh, their uh, for, uh, you know uh, treasury income. So uh, that is also provided a cushion on the NPA provisions that they have done this time around. So NPA provisions have increased 274% YOY and about 234% sequentially. We are uh, seeing a profit uh, decline of 23% quarter on quarter, which is weighing on the sentiments of investors today. Back to you. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot uh, for that, uh, Abhishek. Well, for the time, we will slip into a short break. On the other side, we'll get chatting with the management of Union Bank of India. We'll discuss the past quarter's numbers and how is FI25 shaping up as well? Stay with us. Welcome back. Uh, we've got a market which is under pressure, 180 points lower, uh, 21,873 is where we stand at. Market breadth is deeply in the red, it was 4 is to 1, decline, uh, declines outnumbering advances, that is now almost 5 is to 1. So it's getting gotten a little worse for the broader market as well. Uh, on to the next management now, Union Bank reported a week set of fourth quarter earnings, operating profits have declined, slippages have increased, deposit growth though is healthy, margins have also improved. Uh, we have the management with us. Uh, uh, we have uh, A. Uh, Mani Kalai is the Managing Director and CEO of the bank. He's uh, joining us uh, j right now. Ma'am, thanks very much. Good morning. Great to have you with us here. Thank you very much uh, for uh, being here on CNBC TV 18. You know, before I get to the numbers and address what you've done and what you'd like to guide for the full year 25, uh, if I can start with something uh, which I think has been on the market's mind for some time, which is, you know, what the RBI is essentially asking uh, all lenders to do, which is raise their uh, standard asset provisioning uh, to 5% on project finance. You know, we spoke with the managements of SBI, we spoke with the managements of uh, PNB, etc. as well. Uh, would you like to tell us what is your exposure at uh, Union Bank to project finance and uh, in what shape or form will this, if this is implemented, because these are still draft rules, if this is implemented in this way, impact you? Yeah, as you already mentioned, these guidelines are still in a very draft uh, phase. And... Uh, we, we, uh, they are going to, uh, you know, propose the increasing of the provision requirement. Now, in our bank, the project finance loans make up to about 28% of our corporate uh, loan book, within which 68% of the projects are already completed, and we are seeing steady cash flows. 
So I think the RBI guidelines, which is now currently in the draft stage, where the impact will be what we find is, you know, it will be manageable, assuming the RBI finalizes the uh, guidelines as it stands. So anyway, we have also sent our feedback to the RBI and we are hoping that the regulation regulator will take a prudent view on this matter. Okay. Uh, Ms. Mani Mikhailai, thank you so much for joining us. I want to talk a little more about the business as well. Uh, the slippages have actually gone up quarter on quarter, which is a segment where you saw an increase in slippages and where are you seeing maximum pain right now? And what's the average slippages that you expect in FY25? Yeah. See, slippages has been consistent in the last uh, three quarters, of course, if you see June, September and the December quarter. But in the March quarter, we had seen a little bit of uh, you know, increase in the slippages in the agri and the MSME sector, of course. Agri, because of the seasonality of the industry, we usually see a slippage in the last quarter. And MSME was a slightly a little more. You can say about, you know, it's almost like 8 to 9% increase in the slippages. MSME slippages, I'm not very much concerned because these are all high, you know, fully collateralized and, you know, covered by CGT MSME growth. And as I see the growth in the sector also, the MSME slippages will come down over a period of time. Agriculture sector also, now that the, you know, harvest season will also commence and then, you know, uh, cropping season will come up. I will see that, you know, these, these slippages will also come down and uh, we will be able to give fresh uh, advances also to this sector. Going forward, also, you know, we will be able to maintain our slippages quite considerably as, you know, what we have seen in the last year also. So, the reason I'm asking is because in the agri sector where you are seeing some pain, right? I mean, I understand that you're confident that things may improve, but some of the sectors like tractors, for example, have been really very weak. And the guidance that are given out by the management also indicates that there may not be any growth in FY25. So, how are you so confident that there will be recovery here? And slippages per quarter for you has gone to almost 3,300 crores. Is there a possibility that it could get worse before it gets better? See, am I, uh, if you look at the kind of loans that we have in the bank, the KCC constitute a major part of the loan. And then remaining is, of course, the FI, uh, sorry, the AFI, the agriculture infra and the you know, allied industries, that is the way our agriculture is, you know, uh, sector looks like. And, you know, substantial number also comes from the gold loan sector. Now, as I go forward, you know, we are giving a lot of impetus to agriculture infra fund towards, you know, giving, go, you know, rural go down and other sectors where I will not see that kind of a slippages. Whereas my focus will be, of course, on the KCC, which forms a large part of the grid. And we have also started STP journeys in the agriculture sector, especially up to 1.6 lakhs. We have started the STP journeys in Karnataka. We have started the STP journey in Madhya Pradesh. And we're also in the phase of doing it in UP also. Wherever the land records are digitized, we're looking at, you know, digitizing the agriculture sector also. So I'm sure that we will be able to take care of the slippages in the agriculture okay. sector also. All right, ma'am, you're sounding fairly confident with regard uh, to the outlook from year on, but give us a couple of numbers. What should the slippage number look like for FY25? And we could wait against the recoveries because that could be relatively higher. If you could give us an absolute number on both these two. Yeah, see my slippages number that I have given guidance for the current FI is of course 11,500 crores. I slipped close to about 11,800 crores in the last year and the year before that it was about 12,500 crores. Year on year my slippages are coming down for very many reasons that I have put a lot of structures in place. Like I have the feet on street, I have got the RCOC, I'm building a very agile call center. There are so many things that I have taken care of. So I'm sure that my slippages will be, you know, control, uh, controllable even in this quarter also, in this year also. 11,500 crores of slippages and uh, how much of uh, recoveries will be what? I think that's a higher number, around 15,000, 16,000 yeah, crores? Yeah, 16,000 crores is what I'm looking at this year also. Okay, and your gross NPS as well, you're expecting it to improve. Does it come down closer gross... to around 4%? Yes, it will be less than 4%. Uh, we had given a guidance of 6% last year, but I am at 4.76 as is March 31. And this year I have given a guidance of uh, less than 4% and I'm sure that I will be able to achieve those numbers. Okay, that's very confident there. What is the outlook as far as net interest margins are concerned for the full year uh, for FY25? And what are we looking at in terms of credit costs? Yes, 
Uh, net interest margin, I'm looking at something like 2.8 to 3%. Last year, we gave a guidance of 3% and I was able to do 3.1. But this year, because we are looking at, you know, probably a rate cut, uh, you know, in the probably in the second or the third quarter of the year. And so I'm looking at a NIM of about 2.8 to 3%. And credit cost, you know, it had a slightly... Uh, in, you know, deteriorated in the last quarter because of, of course, the slippages. Uh, it went up to 0 0.66. So I'm uh, looking at something less than 1% in the current uh, year with regard to slippages also. Uh, well, we appreciate when you give us numbers with regard to the outlook. So that's good. Uh, leave us with the final number. What is the loan growth likely to look uh, like for the coming year? I believe in low teens. Yeah, uh, the loan growth, uh, you know, we are looking at uh, projections of uh, GDP growth at 7%. Usually the thumb rule is, you know, twice the number or one and a half times the uh, uh, GDP numbers. So advances growth, I'm looking at 11 to 13% in the current uh, year. All right, uh, ma'am, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. Great speaking with you and uh, good luck. Uh, it's a pleasure. Well, the voting for the fourth phase of the 18th Lok Sabha elections is underway. 96 seats will see polling uh, today. Uh, we basically will get to, by the end of uh, the day, we'll actually get to about 70% done as far as this Lok Sabha elections are concerned. Uh, if you look at the total number of seats, 283, of course, got done in the first three, another 96 today. We have uh, journalist Sanjeev Srivastava joining us now to take us through... Uh, you know, uh, what, which are the most important... I mean, uh, Sanjeev, hi, good morning, first of all. Prashant, this side, good to have you back. You know, last time... Very uh, good morning, Prashant. For these 96 seats, if you look at what, what the uh, BJP did in 2096 and what the opposition did, uh, I mean, uh, they, they, they were not... In, the, in these seats which are going to poll today, they're not exactly in a position of strength. Uh, not their strongest kind of uh, uh, sort of catchment area in that sense. W what are the most two yeah. or three important things you're watching out for in this, uh, th uh, this fourth phase? So this election is um, turning out to be a very interesting one, as we can all see. And it is becoming closer than what one thought earlier. So this phase, uh, the seats are largely in Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Odisha, and Maharashtra, and um, maybe a couple of other states. So I'm right now in Mumbai. I have been traveling Maharashtra, the Marakwada region. And before that, for three days, we were in Andhra and uh, Telangana. So I think Telangana, it's a clear heads up for the Congress party. It is likely to be in the pole position out of 16, uh, 17 seats there. I think they may get n nearer to 10. Number two will be BJP. BRS is looking like a finished party. OVC likely to retain its seat. Andhra, it's a two-horse race, but for the parliamentary picture, it really doesn't matter who wins. Because in the end, both Jagan and Naidu, whoever gets more MPs, they are likely to go with the BJP in the end if the BJP needs them. It's Maharashtra, which I think is becoming the most, one of the most crucial and critical states in this election. Because uh, here they had, uh, the NDA alliance had 42 out of 48. And right now it's really, the election is going down to the wire. It's basically Maratwada region. NDA looks very much on the defensive for a number of issues. The Maratha agitation, the onion farmers getting angry. Uh, the, the, the anger or dissatisfaction or sympathy, whichever way you call it, about the manner in which NCP and uh, Sena were split. So all those factors coming to the fore, uh, and not very good signs, at least in this space. In Mumbai, as you get nearer to the metro, Mumbai, you again see BJP and NDA coming back. But in the interiors, it's a different story. Mm. Sanjeev, uh... <clears throat> has your overall, as we kind of progress through this election, has your overall num overall projection changed in that sense? I, I remember asking you this once before. Well, you put me in a spot last time. <laughs> <laughs> so why not again? <laughs> so I don't think it's it's very difficult to, A, to come to that number which I came last time, which I think was 270. Yeah. I think, see, what, I, what my understanding is that it's... Uh, it's uh, it's getting increasingly difficult for the BJP to convincingly cross that majority halfway mark. Now, whether it will cross or not, I have no way to tell. If it falls short, will it fall short by a few seats or a more number of seats? Again, these are very micro. It's impossible to judge. But I think it's the election is getting too close for comfort to be called 
for the BJP that the BJP is clearly winning big time. So that scenario is gone. Now we are having a contest. BJP clearly to me looks like the single largest party by a mile, by a few miles. But single largest with what number is something which uh, we can debate upon and talk about endlessly with pros and cons. Mm. Uh, and and uh, this is, I mean, you know, this, this reassessment in that sense, what you're saying, right, uh, <clears throat> is, is making the markets also quite worried. Uh, what is leading to this reassessment in that sense, Sanjeev? Because as people are traveling and looking at the election closely and as things are coming out, see a month back, like I told you last time also, Prashant, if, uh, if around the 1st or 2nd of April you would have asked me, I would have said, why talk about elections? It's a done deal. BJP is clearly true. But as the situation has started unfolding, or maybe it was already unfolded, but journalists were not traveling on the ground. They were not doing their, I think, legwork properly because it was too early. But as you start traveling out, you can sense that Modi remains the most popular leader. A lot of people, actually a large majority still want him as prime minister. But there's just so many local equations, local issues coming to the fore. And certainly the sheen has gone off him also a little vis-a-vis -vis 2019. So all those factors have combined together to make this election much closer than what the BJP would have liked. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, this is still, of course, uh, not done. As I said, uh, we'll be 70% done. So, yeah, uh, uh, but uh, there are, of course, uh, more phases left. Sanjeev, we'll leave, you, leave it there uh, for now. Thank you very much for joining us. Quick conversation, but useful as always uh, to get a Thank pulse you. of how these elections are uh, going on. We'll uh, sort of uh, wrap up on uh, this edition of Bazaar. Uh, it's a, a goodbye from all of us here. Uh, thank you very much for staying with us. But Chartbusters will pick up on the action in just a bit from now.